I'm going to call the meeting to order at 7.22 p.m. Welcome to the PBUSD board meeting. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Yorenia Lopez. That's not, yes it is. Um, bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta Directiva de PBUSD. Disponemos de transición en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte a Yorenia Lopez. This meeting will be live streamed and recorded. If someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and submit it to Alicia Jimenez prior to the agenda item. Once an item has begun, cards will not be accepted for that item. Each speaker will have two minutes with the total time for public input on each agenda item to 30 minutes maximum. I see a lot of new faces here tonight, so I want to take a moment to establish some ground rules. There may be differences of opinion, sometimes strong differences. Please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business for PBUSD School District. I also want to remind everyone of the adoption of the Governing Board of Education of PBUSD's established and adopted meeting norms from our previous meeting at the end of August. I would also like to remind everyone that we do have a student trustee who is sitting up here with us as well. Please be considerate of his attendance in your comments. I will now move us to item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask Trustee Dr. Holm to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. I'm now going to move us to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. Um, these comments will be made by Dr. Heather Contreras, our superintendent of PBUSD Schools. We'll make a few comments. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have one, Chris Webb. Oh, thank you, community. Um, I just want to say at the last meeting, um, your report about the the time that we got here, um, like what, like as a as a sports guy, when I join like a new team, like I I don't make a lot of big moves until I've like paid my dues, and um, for I think for the community, that's a pretty big move, the limit to thirty minutes, and I actually feel like it hinders. Um, the community involvement here, which is should be an asset, and uh, like a year ago when um, a public or a private contractor assessed us and was talking about hiring a superintendent and stuff, this is a point that they made, and I feel like it is our it is a strength of this community. So I feel like we shouldn't really hinder it. Also, if we want to like maintain the values of integrity and um, equity, then we can't really do that. And one thing I'll, I, I also think is like, I, I appreciate and respect this board for the, for the work they put in. So I think like part of that work is hearing the community. I would urge you to reconsider that. Also, um, there, there's other districts. I know they do it differently. I don't necessarily think they do it better. I moved here to, to work, took 10 grand less, but I've long held that we have historically had better working conditions, better union, better governance. Um, so I, I don't want you to, to, don't ruin that. Don't ruin that because if we don't have the pay and we lose these other things, then like we lose the attraction. So I, I think you are doing a great job with like the budget team. And this is like an area where I don't want you to follow a bad lead. So please consider that. Thank you. Dr. Contreras. Thank you, Mr. Webb. I appreciate your input and feedback. Uh, so this week, or the last two weeks since our last board meeting, have been an exciting time in um, PVUSD. We had our State of the District address, which has been an annual um, updating to the community of the State of the District. This has been happening for many years, but it was the first time I um, was able to present information about our community um, to our community. 
uh, that is recorded and will be on our website, but I'm also taking the state of the district on the road uh, to do some evening presentations, one up in the Aptos area and one in the Watsonville area as well, so that um, anyone who is restricted by the time uh, that we held the state of the district, which was in the morning, would have an opportunity to go. So I'm looking forward to that. I've met with uh, teachers and students at EA Hall, PV High School uh, this week and listen to um, their thoughts about what's working and what is not working as well as students from the Superintendent's Advisory Council and that's been uh, wonderful. And today I had the opportunity to work with our um, curricular council um, in the PVFT office and that was really exciting to hear the different share outs and concerns and it, it helps us I think to look at ways we can be better as a district. So it was um, a good part Part of the last couple of weeks, and I look forward to the upcoming weeks to come. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. We will now move to item 3.4, governing board comments, reports on standing committee meetings. This is an opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have one, Chris Webb. Oh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to exercise my free speech. Finally, it's been a couple of weeks. I've been I've been wanting to say welcome, Daniel Esqueda. Uh, and uh, normally, I would say something about like you, your position historically, in my eyes, has been like um, the conscience of the community. But I feel like you already get that. Yeah. So I feel like you're, you've been very impressive to me. Um, so one thing, maybe you're the right guy to hear this. Um, like years back. Uh, I remember talking about unions in school, like labor rights and stuff, and then like I tied it to PVFT and a kid's like, well, why don't, where's our union? I was like, well, you know, look at my shirt, support for teachers is support for students. And I've always tried to like maintain that as like an operating principle. Um, but at around that same time, there was an organization, a student led called uh, PVUSD Students Deserve. Maybe you are the guy who can make some kind of institu lasting institution, something that will last beyond you to organize students and uh, make sure they're fully represented. In another district where they have student trustees, the student trustees are like co-opted by the board and the admin and it comes off very phony. I feel like you're a genuine person, I appreciate that. Um, also, the other thing I want to say is on 9-11, um, they're, <laughs> There was a, an, an ally of mine in the union who, who characterized some of your work board uncharitably. I just want you to know that while I agree with um, the public many times on, their, on a given issue, I don't necessarily always agree with how they approach you. So I, I want you to know that. And I do appreciate you guys putting in the work for the governing board values and the handbook and everything. I just ask, don't even tell it to us unless you're really willing to live it out. Because that, to me, it actually creates like a hostile work environment when um, we're operating for real and others aren't. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. We will now start with our student trustee, Daniel Esquida. Thank you, President Acosta. Uh, this past Friday, history was made as I became the first student trustee to ever speak at the State of the District event. Um, I want to thank I want to thank um, Dr. Contreras and Alicia. I want to sincerely thank Dr. Contreras and Alicia Jimenez for the invitation, and my speech highlighted the importance of relationships and belonging within our community. And I was honored to speak amongst several leaders. Uh, yesterday, during our super superintendent's inner high committee meeting, Aptos High concluded its successful homecoming week, including its parade around the school. On Saturday, they hosted their homecoming dance and had over 560 students attend. Aptos is now shifting its focus on creating its student senate for this school year. But for a while now, Aptos High has dealt with large potholes on Mariner Way, which can damage cars and is a safety issue for cyclists. Considering Mar Mariner Way is a Santa Cruz County road, I advise the district to advocate for Mariner Way to be repaired by the Santa Cruz County Public Works Department. Watsonville High also concluded their homecoming week. And additionally, Watsonville High's homecoming week went extremely well with security making everyone feel safe and no ins and outs. The rally and parade were successful despite the intense heat which prompted the school to provide water stations for all students. On top of these events, their spirit week included workshops for students and teachers to design spirit jeans and tie-dye. 
Watsonville High was forced to cancel their Friday night game due to the power outage, but they were able to continue the game the next day um, on the homecoming dance. Powell Valley is celebrating their homecoming week this week, including a Friday rally and a Saturday homecoming game and dance. The ASB is working diligently by putting up decorations and event planning. Powell Valley High students would like to see an increase in water dispensers, considering there is only one on campus in the cafeteria. And finally, as we are aware, this is Trustee Jennifer Holmes' last meeting with us. I would just like to take the time to commend you, Trustee Holm, for all your hard work these past years. You have been extremely welcome to, welcoming to me ever since I arrived on this board as a student trustee, and I will always be grateful for your warmness. Although you will be leaving this board, you will continue to shape the future generations of nursing students, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, student trustee Esquida. We will now move to trustee Bellano Scow. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and good evening to everybody watching. Just a few brief comments, because I know we have a long meeting. Thank you for the State of the District and to Senator John Laird, who attended. I think that's great that he comes and supports PVUSD. Um, thank you for the report about PV High Water. We'll get on that. Uh, another great update. And air conditioning, always uh, a complaint, and obviously with its incredible heat wave. Another important reason for Measure M to be passed, but also I think it'd be cool if sometime we could have a report about air conditioning because a lot of our schools, half of them have air conditioning, so half of them don't, and I know it's a backlog, so maybe we just, because we're getting lots of questions about it, PV High is all air conditioned, you know it. <laughs> Dr. Holm, thank you for your service. You've been an awesome colleague, very steady, very fair, and uh, showed me, I learned, I learned a lot from you in this past year and a half, so. I know you're going to be doing a great job as the Cabrillo Nursing Director, and, and I think your decision, as, as a bummer as it is for us, is also one of integrity as well, because you know that this takes a lot of time. So thank you for your service. Thank you, Trustee Bellano scout Trustee DeSerpa? Um, I, yeah, I just echo what the other board members are saying about Jen Holm. I'm really going to miss you here on the board. You've been a backbone um, of justice and ethics and equity. And I really, really have appreciated um, your sisterhood here. So we're gonna miss you, Jen, but best of luck. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Dr. Holm. Good evening. So serving on the school board for the past six years has been an incredible privilege. And it has been both a, cho a joy and and of course, at times a challenge to work alongside you know, this community to improve the lives of our students and families. I've mentioned this quote before, but I'm gonna bring it back. And Winston Churchill once said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. And I think we've all experienced just how true that can feel at times. The democratic process can be difficult, chaotic, and exhausting. You know, we don't always agree and debates can be heated. But amidst the long hours, the disagreements and the complex decisions, there is something undeniably beautiful about what we do here together. And what has become clear to me is that when we treat each other with respect, that we can be adversaries on important issues, but we need not be enemies. It is in this messy, imperfect process that we find the true power of collective action. I also want to express my deep gratitude for the work of our PBSD community, our students, families, and the dedicated, classified, certificated, and administrative staff. I want to expend, extend a special message of gratitude to all of you who show up to make these meetings happen, whether you're setting things up making sure the AV equipment is working, providing translation, giving presentations, or offering public comments, or simply showing support. This is what democracy looks like. It may be imperfect, but it's ours. And it works because of each and every one of you. Thank you for allowing me to serve on this dais for the last six years. It has been an honor. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Daniel Dodge, Jr. 
Um, good evening, everybody. You know, thank you for attending. I know we have a long meeting, but I just want to start off to say, you know, thank you, Trustee Holm. Um, me and you came in being trustees. We didn't know nothing about COVID. We didn't know nothing about fires or floods. But you hung in there. You know, we served together, and I know you're you're going off. I, I know you're a great leader. You. You are the future of teaching our nurses at Cabrillo. And, you know, we need nurses. And I, I'm, I'm glad you're taking the step that you are to teach not just one generation, but generations of nurses. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. <clears throat> also, too, um, I'm not sure if everybody got their ballot in the mail, but I got my ballot in the mail at Lincoln Street. And I, I want to ask people to support Measure M. You know, I know nobody likes taxes, especially on their, their property, but this is about our schools, our, 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 our children. You know, when you look at, you know, where, where I come from, Minnie White, Radcliffe, Watsonville High, Ian Hall, like, we need to fix these, these schools and these infrastructures, these air conditioning, you know, these air conditioning you know, that for years at Watsonville High, we, they've been asking for, and so, this is the time to put that vote to action, so please support Measure M. Uh, I was also able to attend the Relay for Life meeting um, with Barbie Gomez and a, a lot of the classified workers who've dedicated 30, at least 30 years to our community. And they plan to bring it back to Watsonville High School, and I look forward for Relay for Life coming back to Watsonville because we can't forget about those you know, who've passed away from cancer or, you know, our brothers, our sisters, our aunts, and we need to support their struggle or our struggle. So if you're looking and being interested, please bring Relay for Life back and please contact Barbie Gomez. And finally, I'd like to thank the superintendent, Dr. Contreras, uh, Erlindo, Sergio, the maintenance and operations, and, and Coach Gregorio. We are finally working at the bleachers and the press box in Watsonville High School. Um, it, it's been a while, but we're, we're doing it. And so I'd, I'd like to thank our administration, our, our classified workers, and everybody putting this together. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Judge Jr. Trustee Flores. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being here tonight. I was able to attend the State of the District where I was able to hear uh, student trustee Esqueda's inspiring speech, good job. And I left there very, very proud of PVUSD and our Pajaro Valley community. It was very uplifting. Um, I also was able to attend the extended learning Pajaro Passport at Gilroy Gardens. It was a beautiful evening. I loved seeing our PVUSD family out there having fun. And when we lost power, everyone just made the best of it. And you, I didn't see anyone griping or complaining and they just stuck it out and we drank lots of water and pulled through and had a beautiful evening under the lights. So thank you to Extended Learning for that. Um, also, um, in response to some emails we've been getting, I did decide to go and I was yard duty at WCSA. And besides tending to a scrape on a, I think he was a first grader, sweet boy, um, and applying a Band-Aid and stopping a student from possibly hurting himself by hanging from a branch. It looked like fun, but still unsafe. It was a good day out there. And lastly, I'd just like to uh, say, Dr. Trustee, Trustee, Dr. Denholm, it's been a pleasure serving with you and you will be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Vice President, Trustee Soto. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending tonight. Uh, Jen, I just want to extend a heartfelt thank you. And it's been an honor, honor and a pleasure to work with you and get to know you. Uh, you're a real sweet woman, and uh, you know, you'll be missed. And I, you know, I encourage you in your new endeavor, and I hope you succeed, which I know you will. So thank you for that. I want to extend a heartfelt thanks to Sheriff uh, Clark. Um, he's... Uh, one of our local law enforcement agencies was in full support of Pajaro Valley. And uh, a couple of things I wanna address regarding some misinformation. You know, there was an email stream regarding the situation at WCSA and uh, 
the way those emails were addressed to the board, when you address the entire board, you make it difficult for us to respond to those. If you wish to address something with us, send us an individual email so that we can respond. There's, there's laws that prohibit us from responding to those. And also, uh, Heather, do we install and maintain sidewalks in the county? We don't, correct? That would be a county issue. So there's a jurisdiction responsibility there, right? So I guess if you want to be part of the team, you need to educate yourself a little bit better. So thank you. Show up to a forum. Thank you, Vice President Trustee Soto. Um, so, um, Dr. Jen Holm, I want to thank you for your years of service on this board. Um, it's, we've had our ups and downs over the six years. We've had disagreements and agreements, and, um, but I always appreciate respect and decorum, and you've delivered that, and I'm appreciative of that. You will be missed, greatly missed, and um, it'll be some hard shoes for us to fill. So I do wish you all the best in your future endeavors as um, both of us also work in higher ed. Um, we also have that great commonality amongst us and appreciation for what we do in our lives outside of this role. And I totally understand um, the juncture you're at in your own life and the decisions you have to make. And I respect that and hold you in high regard because I know that's a, a tough balance and decision to make. So I just really want to thank you and commend you for your years. The six years may, it feels like it was a nanosecond, right? But it has left a good impression, and nonetheless, um, this board that's sitting up here right now, one of the best legacies that this board has done yet, there's a couple, but one of them is hiring Dr. Superintendent, uh, Dr. Heather Contreras as superintendent of PBUSD schools, and that is one of the best decisions that this board has ever made by far. Okay, and I'm really appreciative that you've been a part of that process and that you started us in that process as board president with me sitting in your second chair as VP. So, and I also appreciate everything I learned under you last year. I could not begin to possibly say how much um, that means to me. Um, I did want to make one other note real quick um, for the public record um, that at our last board meeting, there was no board member and no PBUSD staff member that contacted or called Watsonville PD to come to our board meeting. It has been brought to our attention that a concerned member of our PBUSD community was watching our last board meeting remotely via the live streaming. And when they observed what was happening at the podium, they were concerned and they contacted Watsonville PD. Now, with that, I think Dr. Contreras has something for you. Again, congratulations, Dr. Holm, and I know that the entire board wishes you the best. With that, we will now um, move to item 3.5, our Red Apple Award, and this will be presented by our PIO, Alicia Jimenez. Thank you very much. Good evening, community. Thank you for being here. Um, 
Dr. Holm, thank you so much for your six years of inspiring leadership. We will miss you. And I have the honor of presenting members of our staff who have been nominated by their peers. There isn't a better statement to the work they do. And I'm going to start by um, honoring Ms. Heather Morin. Is she's here? Heather Morin? Come on up. Heather Morin is always on top of things. She works well with HR, and together we have been able to staff as our special education department. Heather Morin is always available for questions, and she is extremely knowledgeable. She is a great example of a true leader. She leads by example, and she embodies the core value of excellence. Thank you for being here today. And I hope the next employee made it. Uh, Jody Richardson, are you here? Jody, Jody, thank you for being here with us. Jody has a long been a champion for our LGBTQ plus population. She is welcoming and open to all students and creates a safe space for students to be themselves. She is empathetic and kind to all students who come to her room. She embodies unity, and she represents New School, by the way. Thank you, Ms. Sue Grotti, for being here. Congratulations, and thank you, Jody. And our next honoree could not be here today. He's from Aptos. His name is Martin Romo. But we do have Assistant Principal Rachel Jones here to receive the, the wonderful red apple on his behalf. Martin is always friendly and helpful to students, teachers, and staff. He will go out of his way to make sure the school is cleaned, repaired, and safe. Martin will take on last moment projects to help out the students, teachers and staff from helping paint ASB building to installing ballast in the elevator lights so handicapped students and staff didn't have to ride in the elevator in the dark. Repairing pumping so art students develop their photographs to covering other custodians routes at the same at the last moment while still having to cover his own work. Martin is an unsung hero of the school, and he embodies integrity. And Martin, I hope you're watching us because you're very much appreciated by your peers. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you, Ms. Jimenez, and to all our thanks to all of our Red Apple recipients. Now I will move us to item 4.1, approval of the agenda. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have one, Bobby Marshall. Good evening, board, uh, Dr. Contreras. Uh, I just wanted to make a request uh, as I look at the agenda today that you would uh, please consider moving the student resource officer presentation to after the employee organizations. Uh, it's getting late and I'm not sure why it was. Maybe we can talk about it, but my only guess would be that maybe there's district personnel who will be presenting that. However, there are a lot of teachers out here who got to work tomorrow, a lot of parents got to work tomorrow, we've got students who got to go to school tomorrow, uh, and I think, I mean, we've limited it to 30 minutes, so it's not going to go more than that. Uh, so in fairness to hearing from the public, it just makes sense to get that up front. Uh, I know uh, as a music teacher, when I have a concert, I know I'm going to be the last one out, so, um, you know, let everybody else go home. So I think if we could just, uh, in the interest of allowing the public to be heard tonight and not having to be here till 9 or 10 p.m., that would be appropriate. Thank you. 
Is this an agenda item? Yes. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of the public, we moved that one up to the very beginning because we do have students who are going to be presenting. And so we wanted to ensure that the students could get home after the presentation at a, a time that might be acceptable. So that, that's why we made that decision for the students. Thank you, Dr. Contreras, for that elaboration. Um, so now, item 4.1, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to accept the agenda. Second. I have a first. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any um, opposed? Any abstaining? Okay. That will carry 701. Next item, 5.1, approval of the September 25th, 2024 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. I have a first. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 701. With regards to item 6.1, the board will have to reconvene to closed session, so we will defer reporting out of closed session until we reconvene to closed session, then come back. We will now move to item 7, report and discussion items. Item 7.1, the Mental Health Clinician and School Resource Officer Program. This report will be presented by our Coordinator of Student Services, Mr. Slider. Mr. Slider, please come up. Good evening, Board President Acosta, Board Trustees, Dr. Contreras, and the PVUSD community. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to give this report on the Mental Health Clinician and School Resource Officer Program for PVUSD. And just as a reminder, we like to anchor um, our activities with the mission and the vision for PVUSD. Um, and so, um, just wanted to uh, make sure that we bring that to uh, the forefront. In addition to that, a um, couple of things that I want to highlight are the goals um, that this is related to. So goal one, engage and sustain the trust, involvement, and responsibility of all parents and community to promote collaborative programs which result in high levels of success for all students. And goal number five, ensure that all students provide, ensure that all students provide a safe uh, sorry, ensure that all schools provide a safe, healthy, and positive school environment for students and staff. And so what I have presented for you is a, it's a very long presentation. This is an abbreviated version of that, and data has been consolidated with the best interests of trying to um, use our time efficiently. Um, and so I just want to make sure that that is highlighted uh, up front. Uh, and so we're going to get started here. So um, in total, uh, for both Aptos High School and Watsonville High School, there was 188 referrals to the SRO mental health clinician team. And so from here on out, I'm just going to refer them as the team. Um, you see up there that uh, Pajaro Valley High School does not have numbers uh, at this point, and that's because the SRO hasn't been put in, in uh, place yet. However, we did hear, um, and we got a word from Watsonville PD that we will have a, um, uh, an SRO in place um, starting November 18th. And so they're going through onboarding, and um, we're going to be able to meet with them um, sometime next week. Um, but a couple th other things to keep in mind for this presentation, the intake data, uh, the referral data, we refer back to the 2023-24 school year. The survey data is from this school year. So it's current survey data that was um, taken within the last two weeks. Uh, and finally, um, we're gonna be going through referral data. We're gonna go through survey data and um, have an opportunity for students and staff to be able to present. And then we also have some following recommendations as a result of taking this opportunity to learn. Um, so we're gonna go through the intake data pretty fast. So as mentioned before, Aptos High School had 188 referrals and Watsonville High School had 191. And those referrals mostly came from administration from both schools. Uh, in terms of referrals at Aptos High School, um, the majority of the referrals were for ninth and 10th graders. At Watsonville High School, 
the majority, well, a good number were from, uh, were for sophomores followed by ninth grade and 11th grade. Um, in terms of students that got referrals um, for the program, um, the majority at each site did not have an IEP or a 504 plan. Um, however, um, when we, we look at uh, those that did have a 504 plan or an IEP, Aptos High School was 34% uh, and Watsonville High School, it was 21%. In terms of ethnicity, and so this is what's reported in Synergy, our school information system at Aptos High School, 51% uh, of the referrals were for students that uh, are identified as being white within the school information system, 49% um, as Hispanic, and then 7.7 .7 as um, we have up there as others. And so for the sake of confidentiality, we, we did not disaggregate that data. At Watsonville High School, 99% um, of the referrals for students that were identified as um, Hispanic in Synergy, and 2.42 uh, as, as white. And so um, what we want to do is make sure that we um, look to the, the bottom table. We see that the overall population for Watsonville High School is 96% um, plus a Hispanic and 2.42 white. And we go back up to Aptos High School and we see that um, our student population Hispanic is, nine, is 49 and for white is 43. So it's kind of in line with the percentages that exist on those campuses. In terms of the types of um, referrals, who they referred to, both Aptos High School and Watsonville High School, those referrals were, the majority were not referred to the team. At Aptos High School, the majority were referred to the mental health clinician, and then followed by the mental health clinician in SRO. At Watsonville High School, the majority were referred to the SRO and an AP, followed by the mental health clinician in SRO. So it was very interesting um, seeing that data. Um, in terms of the reasons for referral, Aptos High School um, shared that 71% um, of them were for safety in following incidents, or maybe there was going to be an incident, and then 28% um, uh, for wellness. Watsonville High School, um, truancy, and then peer conflict, and then um, emotional uh, concerns, or emotional, um, where am I here? Um, mental health concerns. And then when we look at the different types of referrals, um, whether they were referrals for ed code violation related or non-ed code violation related, 68% of the referrals at Aptos High School were related to ed code violations. Um, a good majority of them are um, defiance disruption, followed by um, possession or under the influence of alcohol or drugs, harassment, and then physical altercation. At Watsonville High School, all of the referrals to the SRO, uh, mental health clinician, that were related to ed code violations were because of physical altercation. Interventions. Um, what we saw with both campuses is that um, a major intervention was referring back to the school's MTSS um, processes, and that's a good thing. So that it got back to our schools, and then we have MTSS teams that then can make the decision of what kind of interventions that we're going to um, be assigning and, and what would be appropriate for those students. Um, the, the other ones that were highlighted were uh, restorative practices or restorative strategies, uh, conflict mediation, uh, emotional support, and then referral to outside agencies. And so that's kind of going through that data really quick because what we wanted to see is the perception data. So we had an opportunity to survey students, uh, parents and caregivers, and staff. And so we're gonna go ahead and report those out right now. Um, so as you can see, Aptos High School had um, 191 students take our survey. Uh, Watsonville High School had 732. Pajaro Valley High School did, didn't have any metrics for that because that program's not in place just yet uh, with the SRO, but a total of 926. And so this is 
um, a video that we want to share with you of students from Aptos High School telling their kind of um, thoughts about the, uh, the program. Oh, it's not working. So how do we do that? It's about a three minute video. You know, you know who they are? Yeah. I do, but I Yeah, I know sort of. Oh, you of them. Right. Um, yeah, a little bit. Do you know who they are? Uh, kind of. I know of Paul. Yeah, a little bit. Do you know who they are? No. Um, I don't think it's a terrible idea to have two officers on campus. I just think there need to be some restrictions to what they are carrying for student safety. But other than that, it is beneficial for student safety to have them on campus. Um, but to share, being on campus, you know, I feel like it's safer, you know? You know, like with someone being around you because it's been, it, just, it just feels different, you know, when it's, there's no chair, no, like, nothing to, like, for enforce rules or anything. Like, things just get out of hand. Yeah. But when the security's here, I feel like it's safer. I think it's a good program, you know, there's always no security there, so just watch, you know, be aware. Awesome. <laughs> they're awesome. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, they're chill. Yeah. I think it's pretty good and they're very helpful around school. I think the program, I don't really mind it on campus. I feel like it's really helpful for others. Um, it's just there if anyone has questions or any concerns, so I think it's a really good program. Um, I personally don't that there's anything wrong with it. I feel that it can be helpful. I think one or two have, but we haven't discussed it much. Um, I've seen my friends interact with them just casually in a civil manner before. There's no real intimidation factor when it comes down to it. It's been good. He's a cool guy. I've talked to him multiple times. Yeah, we have a good relationship. Um, really fun. They make the campus feel really safe, and um, they're really fun to talk to about anything, really. So. Um, my friends still support them well. They're being good. I mean, they're chill with us. We'll be chill with them. Um, they make us feel like really safe and like have like resources that we can like go to during school, so we don't feel like unsafe while we're at school. It's not too clear, but my friends have and. Uh, the chair's handled it very nicely and well. Thank you. So um, there are more students that were interviewed than what was shown on the, the video. We did have to bring it down to a certain time, but then there was also students that didn't mind being interviewed and giving input. Uh, but didn't want to be on the video itself. And so this is part of that consolidation that I was talking about. So if we look at the top, we see Watsonville High School, we see Aptos High School at the bottom. And what we can see um, with blue being yes, agree, comfortable, the yellow being neutral, and the red being no, disagree, uncomfortable. Um, as we go through each of the metrics, you can, you can do the comparison between the two sites. So in terms of experience, having contact with the team, um, the overwhelming majority of the students have not had contact with the team. We can see that with 91% uh, and 80% uh, for both schools. Um, make me feel safe. Um, interesting, we do see that there is a lot more blue for each school, uh, but then there's a lot of neutral to that. So students um, you know, felt like they made them feel safe. Many more students were kind of neutral about it, and then a few felt that it didn't make them feel safe having the team there. Uh, distraction from school, uh, for the most part, for, for most schools, um, that's around 71%, 70% that didn't feel that presence was a distraction, um, around 25% 
were neutral about it, and um, around 3% felt that, that that team distracted them from being at school. Um, comfortable with their presence, uh, 35% and 52% at um, Aptos High School felt comfortable. Uh, again, we see that large amount of yellow where there's that neutral, so they're not, uh, it, they don't agree or disagree um, in any one direction. And then uh, we have 2.9% at Watsonville felt uncomfortable with their presence, 1.5% at Aptos felt uncomfortable with their presence. And then in terms of um, feeling comfortable um, going to the team or referring a student to the team, um, again, we see that blue, we see a lot of yellow, so that neutral. And then for both uh, Watsonville and Aptos High School, around 11% felt that um, they, they wouldn't be comfortable uh, referring them. And with that, I would like to um, welcome our, our Watsonville High School student, um, who's going to just say a couple things about um, their thoughts about the program. Hi, good evening. My name is Anise Alvarez. I'm currently enrolled in Watsonville High School. My first personal experience with the SRO mental health clinician program was during my freshman year when I had an incident with another one of the other students. The other student decided to press charges and as a student who really didn't get along with most adults, CJ and Maria did not only do a good job on handling the situation, they also did their job professionally and made sure it was fair at all times. After joining the program, it turned me into a better um, person than I was before after joining the program. No, sorry, before joining the program. I can walk into school and be at peace with myself and with others around me. I stopped involving myself with bad influences and started becoming a better version of myself. They focused a lot on, on my mental health and they made sure I was okay at all times. And I wanna thank you all for sitting here and listening to this speech. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, sharing. I know it takes a lot of courage to uh, do that in front of a lot of adults, so thank you. Um, if we continue with uh, the survey uh, results, um, we had an opportunity to survey our family and caregivers. Um, 131 uh, family caregivers took the survey from Aptos High School, 111 from Watsonville, again zero from Pajaro Valley for a total of 248. And we take a look at the metrics again, and we can see that there are commonalities between the two. Um, again, blue is yes or agree. Uh, yellow was a little bit more interesting because um, it, it stands in this particular survey for somewhat neutral sometimes, or maybe depending on the question, and then no and disagree for red. And as you can see, um, when we ask the question about is the relationship between students and the SRO, mental health clinician, beneficial, we see that there's a, a, a big majority of blue for both of the schools, followed by um, somewhat uh, with yellow. And then at Watsonville High School, we have 11.7 who felt that it wasn't beneficial in Aptos High School, 3.6. Um, in terms of making me feel safe, uh, we have 73% and 75%, followed by a, that good chunk of yellow for neutral at 18 and 21%. And then 7.2% at Watsonville High School reported that it doesn't make them feel safe in 2.9 at Aptos High School. Um, in terms of being an intricate part of overall safety, 73% at Watsonville High School and 74% at um, Aptos High School, followed by sometimes. And then 9.9% .9 of the families and caretakers reported that, um, it, that the team is not an intricate part of the overall safety at Watsonville High School, 2.9 for Aptos High School. And then finally, uh, the question was uh, detriment if eliminated. So if the program was no longer there, 66.7% agreed that it would be a detriment. Um, at Watsonville, 78% at Aptos, followed by maybe. And then when we look at um, that felt that it wouldn't be a detriment, 117 at Watsonville High School and 8.1. And so the questions that we asked for these surveys were consistent with the last uh, survey questions uh, that were asked of the community um, a few a few years back when this was done. 
And then finally, um, the staff survey. So at Aptos High School, 62 uh, staff took the survey. Watsonville High School, 21 staff took the survey um, for a total of 83. And when we look at the data, we can see that there are some consistencies with overall trends, but we do see that there are some shifts with some of the colors. So relationship beneficial, same as with parents. Um, we see at Watsonville High School, 57% felt that it's beneficial, 77.4% at Aptos High School, followed by somewhat, um, and then 9.5% and 32 felt that it was not beneficial, that relationship. In terms of making me feel safe, 61%, uh, close to 62% at Watsonville High School, 75% uh, at uh, Aptos High School. Then we have neutral followed by 6.5% at Aptos that, that does not make me feel safe, 4.8% at Watsonville High School. Um, looking at uh, de-escalation, um, again, following the trend, we got the blue, a lot more somewhat, so not um, one, one, you know, agree or disagree, uh, and then 4.8. Uh, at Aptos High School, 72% said that they were effective for de-escalation. And then intricate part of overall safety, 57% at Watsonville, 80% at Aptos High School. And then this is where it kind of shifts a little bit. So we take a look at Watsonville High School, we can see 14.3% did not feel that the team was an, an intricate part of the overall safety, um, and 3.2% at Aptos High School. And then detriment, if eliminated, that same percentage of 14.3 felt that it wouldn't be a detriment at Watsonville High School if the program was eliminated. 3.2, the same um, uh, percentage uh, felt that it wouldn't be a detriment. And so with that, I would like to welcome um, a couple of our representatives from each of the schools to just say a quick something, and then we'll look at some of the narrative feedback. Hi, I'm Joe Gregorio, a principal of Watson High. Um, I had the um, opportunity to be part of the pilot program, and we first uh, talked about Bringing back uh, the SRO uh, was the combination of uh, the mental health clinician with SRO. And um, when we went through this process, it was a very um, deliberate uh, idea of combining the two entities in terms of uh, addressing the issues with the kids and, and more supporting. So the mental health clinician and the SRO, we had, it was a special kind of situation of having a personalities that combined. So whenever a situation were to happen, it was always the idea of restorative uh, uh, trust building with the students. That if something happened, they would come in and they would see the SRO and the mental health, and mental health clinician as one. With the idea, how can we help the student? How can we get and find what the student needed? So that was the idea. And uh, we were lucky enough that the, um, the people we have right now, Maria martinez Leon and uh, Charles Johnson really blended great together. And to the point we have kids that just come and hang out in the office as they feel comfortable to be able to talk to them to, uh, before things happen to address those issues. So um, it has been a blessing in terms of that, uh, it's, it feels like another avenue and another resource for our kids at Watsonville High in that term. And that's always been the idea, is that the SRO and the mental health are an asset and a, a viable resource for our kids. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, trustee members, community members. Um, my name is Rachel Jones. I'm one of the assistant principals at Aptos High School. Um, it's my third year as assistant principal, and I've had the privilege to work with our, we call it our restorative response team, our SRO and mental health clinician team. And they're truly amazing. I feel privileged every day to work with them. Um, they're a critical, critical part of our community, our school community, but also our admin team relies on them heavily for support, and they do support us. So um, the Restorative Response, response Team at Aptos High works closely with the entire campus community, from students to admin, wellness team, counselors, campus supervisors, our front office, and our teachers. 
and they, with the goal of fostering a safe environment that offers a strong emotional support and nurtures students and their aspirations. The team supports students in a wide range of situations, including conducting risk and threat assessments, assisting students in distress or crisis, and providing case manage management by connecting students with long-term providers within the district and the community. They also support re-entry meetings, and that's a really critical piece of what they help us with, provide emotional check-ins, follow up with students after an incident, and engage with parents to ensure ongoing support for students. Building positive, trusting relationships with students and the campus community is at the heart of their work, and we are very, very proud of what they've done on our campus over the last three years. Um, as you saw with our data, our mental health clinician um, is a, also an integral part of our um, PBIS, our culture and climate team. She belongs to our team, um, attending those monthly meetings, also part of our wellness team. And um, in many situations, we call on her daily um, for check-ins, and she does a phenomenal job. We also work with our SRO officer, and they work as a team, but we also individually work with them. So they're um, a, a huge asset to our school, both of the um, SRO and the mental health clinician. Something new that's happened this year that I want, really want to emphasize is that they've started to be seen on campus a bit more. Our, the students that work with them love them, but they now push into our ninth grade health classes and they do a lot of educational pieces. And I feel like that's huge because it really breaks down that barrier and it creates connection and builds relationships. So they, it's an area of growth for us, but it's also something that this year they've really made huge strides in, in achieving. So we're very proud of the work they've done so far. And um, this whole process was actually quite informative and we, we found it um, very um, helpful for us actually as a team where we were able to sit down and find some other areas that we'd like to improve upon in terms of data collection. So thank you. So um, I'm going the wrong way. We had over 900 survey responses for students and how do we even like think about whittling them down to just you know just to highlight some voices and so I did that um, I welcome the community and, and for everyone here to look at the full uh, presentation but I'm just going to only highlight a few of them if we were to do this by ratio the the what we would see is that the majority of the responses from students would be we, we I didn't know we had that team or I don't have any more feedback, um, followed by, um, I think it's a great idea, I like it, it makes me feel safe, uh, followed by, you really should have changed the questions so I can answer questions about the mental health clinician only and then about the SRO only. And then we also had um, comments about how it's not a good idea having uh, an SRO on, on the campus. And so it ranged from there. But because we wanted to make sure that we had all voice on here, we didn't put them on here based on proportion. We put them on here to make sure that um, different points of use could be highlighted. So we take a look at the first one on here. The mental health clinician and SRO team have done a, a well job at keeping the students welcome and feeling safe. The fourth one says, I wish we knew more about them. I would be more comfortable with them, especially the SRO team, if they engage with the community more. And then the sixth one down, every question I answered applied to the SRO, not the mental health clinician. The mental health clinician is an amazing and a needed, and a needed addition on our campus that increases safety and health. My answers apply to the SRO who should not be grouped with mental health clinician as the SRO makes campus feel less safe and makes me uncomfortable when I'm around him. On the next slide, the fifth one down, I haven't built a relationship with them enough to trust them. Next slide, second one down, I feel safe and comfortable knowing that there's people on campus willing to help whoever needs, to, needs it or people who don't like to seek help from others and there are people willing to give them a chance and open up. So as you can see, we're trying to make sure that all um, points of view were represented um, with that. For the parents, um, second one down, as a parent of a freshman, I have received zero information about the SRO and mental health clinician program. It is hard to answer the survey without having 
provide, been provided any information. My suggestion is that you send out information to students and parents about the purpose and the intent of the program and how it is meant to make our students and staff feel safe and why having the addition of a mental health clinician with an SRO is important. Fourth one down, SRO officers are needed at schools. They play an integral role in our community. Our students need to not be afraid of law enforcement and a key way to doing that is to have them be a part of the school community. Second one down, my family has met with the SRO mental health clinician regarding an issue my daughter had with a student. It was very positive experience considering the circumstances they made us feel comfortable and we had to go had we had to go to the sheriff's office for the incident, it would have been a very intimidating scenario. My daughter was able to share her experiences with classmates, encourage her classmates to seek, speak with someone about the same issue she was having with the same student. Um, and so there's more, and for the sake of, of saving time, I'm gonna go on to the staff feedback now. So second one down, personally I love having the mental health clinician on campus, but I would prefer not to have the SRO on site. All of my responses above are yes for the mental health clinician and no for the SRO. Fifth one down, I think you should have separated the questions to only include the SRO and then only include the mental health clinician. They are two separate things and could make people answer uh, is in a negative way when they only have negative feelings towards one. Uh, the first one, um, I feel it's great to have them on campus for safety and it shows as well. There are things that the school staff just cannot do that an SRO can and with the support of the mental health clinician can support for all of us. I feel that our SRO keeps us safe and allows quick and efficient response to crisis that would otherwise not we would not otherwise have. And then the third one down, I think this partnership is very important to the safety and well-being of students uh, at our school. And again, like I said, we, we tried to put balance um, points of view with this. And with that, our recommendations based on this opportunity to do this self-study about the program and, and report out is um, data-wise, continue collecting the interaction log data um, but bring back uh, review, update, and implement the student and staff experience survey after each mental health clinician and SRO interactions that are, re that are referral related. And so that was there for a time, it stopped, we're gonna bring that back. Um, and then continued including the mental health clinician team into the MTSS process. And that's both with our climate and culture, like what Ms. Jones had talked about, and also the MTSS team as well. And then finally, response to stakeholder feedback. Um, based on this, the biggest aha is that we know that there's not enough communication that has gone out about the purpose of the SRO and the mental health clinician teaming together. And so our response to that would be to create a communication plan to inform all students, parents, caregivers, givers, and staff of the duties, activities, and responsibilities of the mental health clinician and the SRO team. Create communication plan to inform all students, parents, caregivers, and staff the processes for requesting assistance from the team. Strategically structure the mental health clinician and uh, resource officer day to increase visibility and engagement on campus during structured and unstructured time of the regular school day. And Ms. Jones had highlighted that, but we know that that's an area of growth. We need to do more of that. And then finally, increase um, the team's visibility and engagement with students, parents, caretakers, and staff during special school-related events. And with that... Thank you, Mr. Slider. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do, and I'll call you up six at a time, please. Omar Diakis, Bobby Peltz, Dr. Barasa, Skyla Higgins, Bobby Marshesaw, and Elias Gonzalez. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think the students spoke in that, in that uh, 
survey that they took, one of the questions that they were asked is if they feel safe having the SROs on campus. And the numbers clearly state 35% yes, 60% said no. Watson High School. Aptos High School, 44% said yes, 49% no. So, I mean, the students are talking, you know, and I think they're the most important voice that we need to listen to in this, in this situation. I think that we need to bring more community-based organizations to be mentors, to be friends, and, and, and work with them in closer uh, relationships and, and work closer with them and the families. Uh, I could tell you, uh, in my line of work, I work with a lot of students. I work with students at EA Hall, PV, Watsonville High School. Today, I was at Watsonville High School with a program called Keys to Life, where we did presentations with uh, about a panel of about five, six, seven, and we, we told our stories. And we told them what, where it took us, and, and we inspired the kids, and, and we uh, gave them hope and stuff like that. And those kinds of programs work. Because after we did our presentations, many students came up and talked to us and said, hey, man, you know what? I'm dealing with this at home. My dad went through this. How do I deal with it? You know, it opened up a door to them to come and speak to us. You know, um, I could tell you also, in my line of work, working with these students, I don't work from 8 to 5. My phone rings 9 o'clock at night from a mom in prison concerned about her sons. A grandmother calling me because they don't have no food. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that our community-based organization does. And it was, I think that uh, we need to reconsider this whole thing and, and look deeper into it and find more of a, get a better survey because uh, the surveys were only a few students compared to the thousands of students that are in these schools. Uh, Bob. Bobby Powell, Watsonville High, I'm here to speak on the SRO data. Back when I first spoke on this issue, I asked for hard data to look at to determine if SRO truly were making a difference. Uh, looking at this data, I have a lot of issues, but only two minutes. Uh, the first concern that I have is the lack of responses. The parent data was pretty heavily in favor of SROs, but we only had a total of 248 responses. I hardly think that is a representative sample size. My second concern is that the survey bundled the SRO with MHC. How do you respond if, like me, you would like to see more mental health support and less police presence? I think that clouds the results. My third concern is the low numbers of students who say they feel safer with an SRO on campus. Both at Aptos and Watsonville, the numbers are less than half. $300,000 is a lot of money to pay for something that less than half of the students find value in. For that kind of money, we could bring in a number of community programs and get a much higher return. My final concern is the lack of data over time. When I looked at the youth truth data over the last six years for Watsonville High School, it showed that students felt safest in schools in November of 2020. That was the same year that SROs were removed from campus. After SROs returned in 2021, students have felt increasingly less safe every year. I'm not trying to say that this is because of the SROs, but it does make me wonder why our students would feel less safe every year, even with an SRO on campus. I think that's a question worth asking, and it needs to be answered with better data than this. I urge the board to go back and take another look with better data. Thank you. Hi, I am Skyla Higgins. I am a mom, a proud mom, and also a teacher at Aptos High School. So excited about that. Um, I'm here tonight to show my support for having an SRO on campus at all times. I see the benefits. I'm out on campus every single day, talking to students, talking to staff, seeing what we're actually dealing with on campus. Not only does having an SRO on campus provide children's safety, but also us as adults. I have had to stop at least three gang fights in my classroom and in my quad. So if you have not had to deal with that as a teacher or a person, it is very hard to understand what we deal with in the classroom every single day. Not just once in a while, this is daily. Um, An SRO on campus has created a positive atmosphere. Um, our SRO, Paul, is able to get to know the kids. I see him, I saw him today, chatting up with the kids upstairs, 
talking to them, joking around. He does create a positive uh, environment for our students. He buys donuts for them, he jokes around, he knows their names, okay? We put our lives at risk every day to protect these kids in our classrooms, and we're able to call the SRO to help us if we need to. Teachers, administrators, and SROs are currently responsible for parenting these kids, sometimes without help from their actual parents. We are trying to teach them and guide them on the right path. Paul, the SRO at Aptos High, keeps a calm, kind presence at our school. He makes time for our kids. The kids know that they can go to him. The kids that sometimes see him are the kids that are causing major issues. And he's able to develop a relationship with them that keeps them on the right path in life. The SROs are the people that continue to have these conversations and we want to create healthy adults that will provide for our community and their own families. And this is very important. Thank you. Oh, somebody left their phone up here. Oh, that's mine. You, you can leave it too. Oh, okay. I'll be back up there. All right. Okay, so good evening. I'm Dr. Barraza, and I'd like to start by apologizing to the family from Aptas High who lost their child. I in no way ever meant to say that this young man's life did not matter. Some of the trustees on this board make absurdly ignorant comments, and this ignorant cause great frustration. As a result of this frustration, I chose my words poorly. I apologize for the pain I may have caused this family. Some trustees are using this young man's death to push their own agenda instead of actually trying to find a real solution to the issue of safety. As I mentioned previously, the school in Georgia had SRO, yet was not able to prevent the death of four people, nor the numerous others who were injured. So what guarantee do we have that if there had been an SRO at Aptos High, this young man would still be alive today? No guarantee. SROs provide a false sense of safety as there is no way that one SRO can protect an entire campus. But if these trustees actually cared about the violence at our schools, they would have listened to both of the parents that came to share their stories and, uh, with their child's experience with bullying the last meeting. You've poorly done, you've done your research poorly because it's very biased. Your survey had leading questions and offered no alternatives to SROs. You also paired the questions together as somebody mentioned earlier. This is not an attack on law enforcement, which has a place in society. It is a critique of the systems that run on fear and control and who think that putting law enforcement on campuses instead of dealing with the root causes of violence. So the problem is, Looking, why don't we research, is it really the clinician or is it the SRO? An SRO gets paid $130 an hour. If it's the clinician, think of how many clinicians we can hire with that money, because I know they get paid about $45 an hour. If we had way more clinicians, maybe we wouldn't definitely need an SRO and kids would feel safer because people would be feeling happier. Good evening again, board. Um, Bobby March Assault. I, uh, as I mentioned before, I was on the uh, Policing and Social Equity Committee in Watsonville, the ad hoc committee. I was also on the over the uh, pilot committee that was for the SRO program that was mentioned uh, by Mr. Gregorio. Um, and I am on the Chief's Advisory Board right now for our city. And so I understand some of the complexities. I'm not by no means an expert, but that's where my, you know, Thoughts come from, at least, right? Um, and I continue to struggle with that we are not having an honest and open conversation, a robust conversation about this. I showed a friend uh, the questions that were asked on, on the survey, and I said, tell me what you think of these. He's got no skin in, skin in the game. And he said, well, they're definitely leading the witness, right? That, that was the first thought. We've said for many years, every time we've said, I will say uh, improvement was made in that we were able to see Aptos split out from Watsonville, which I don't think we did last time. And I appreciate it, including some of those statements by students. I think those are both improvements in our data. Thank you. Um, however, we've said over and over again, we all know that the mental health clinician is supported. Like, I don't think that's controversial. The question is armed officers. And so let's ask those questions and not lump them together. I was looking at this data with my son, who's a senior at Watsonville High before coming today. And I was asking him his thoughts as we looked at it. And one of the things he said about even some of the, the neutral position, he said, well, I think honestly, a lot of people don't know how to answer when they lump them together and it confuses it. And so they go neutral. 
He said, you know, when it says, do you want to get rid of them? Well, they want the mental health clinician, and it's just not clear. What are we doing to reach out to some of the more vulnerable and marginalized students to get their opinions, right? We get these, a video of 13 students who agree, and it, it just feels it disingenuous. We have one student share who I commend her. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. Why did we not have, if you want a student who's not in favor, I could get them here for you. I know some of them. Let's have an honest conversation about this issue. Uh, by the way, CJ is not on campus right now and won't be because he's on leave for several months. Let's look at the data. Are there issues going on while he's out? That would be an important thing to note. Um, buenas noches. Um, I'm still tired and I'm still gonna show up. Um, but it, I'll be honest, it's hard to come to this board and even try to share my thoughts or feelings because I've been showing up for six or seven years. I've been nothing but respectful in these spaces and at times I'm um, called certain names and we're offend called out here in this space. So that's not cool at all. Okay, I think it's not productive and we're trying to build in a relationship here. So let's work in that positive way. You as leaders need to do that. So again, lead by example. Uh, secondly, I think for me, again, it's hard just to come up here and say those things. But again, trying to be very respectful, trying to be very courteous, because that's what mama taught me, and I'm going to walk those ways, right? Um, but again, um, the survey, uh, I don't know where it came from. I think I've seen something similar before in the past. Uh, and again, it was something that was very misleading. Uh, it was something that actually does not include the voice of the community. From the community I talk about are those that are impacted by these systems. Right. Um, I know a little bit about research. I have worked with the Vera Institute of Justice. They are a leading researcher in the nation. A couple of the things that we learned around surveys when we did surveys in prisons was that we go ask the people directly these questions. It matters who you ask. Right. It also matters who asks the questions. Right. And it also matters what we actually do with those results. Right. Uh, do we go back to the people and actually say, is this the actual story or do we just show up and say that's what the numbers say? Because we can all distort numbers here and we can do that. But I'll stop there. The last thing I want to sit there and say is the one thing I saw here is that 20 percent, I think, of students, actually 80 percent of students have not been have not had experience. And at Aptos High School, 91 percent have not had experience in Watsonville High School. If we really want to save money and we're investing into a program that's only getting 20% of services and 9% in another county, we should look at cutting something like this because this is not beneficial for our folks. What I learned is that we need more mental health. We don't need the SROs. Thank you. All right, next group. Oh, is there more? Chris Webb, Carolina Moreno. Bernie Gomez, Kristen Hurley, and Nick Baldridge. Uh, I also want to commend uh, Mr. Slider for improving upon the previous year's presentation by um, ensuring we had not just the same kind of voice um, that, that gives this a little more integrity. Um, that is a Good, good point that people are making about the putting the two items together. And um, this is where I would turn to uh, Trustee Esqueda. And if you were to have that student group and set up your own survey, I feel like, um, I know for me, like that carries a lot of weight. Like I, I'd, I'd kind of trust that more. I know like last year when um, Renaissance had their survey, I felt like when I compared this one, or the SRO one from last year to our, our in-house survey, I felt like ours had more integrity. Um, also, one thing that I brought this up before, but like, you know, during the SRO time, there was a there was an incident in Renaissance, somebody brought something real bad, and then it wound up involving, leading to a kid getting searched from my class, and I didn't like the way it happened, and I, as a teacher, I don't feel like um, I'm being protected in being able to protect my students from improper searches and the like. So I feel like we could address this kind of easily by just putting out a policy where um, instead of the parentis loco 
automatically going to the admin, let parents, if they so choose, and if a teacher is willing, take on that um, duty of parentis loco and be the one to decide when it's appropriate to make a search. Um, also, I think there is huge opportunity costs here. Um, you know, we, we just last meeting, oh, we can't do different things. We can't have an election because of, uh, you know, money. When we have something like this and the data doesn't always reflect uh, like the highest value, these, all these comments about the budget, um, they, they lose integrity. Thank you. Kristen Hurley, um, I'm here just to speak in support of the SRO program in general at the PV schools. Um, it's, I think it's true that it's unfortunate that we've come to the place where we need extra security on campus, um, but until we figure out the details around that, um, I'm grateful for the extra support for students and staff. Um, the last few meetings and even tonight, I, I've it's my opinion, I'm hearing a lot of kids feel unsafe with the security officers on campus. That's kind of a big theme. Um, the only reason a child or a young adult would feel unsafe is around law enforcement um, on a school campus would be maybe because some adult in their sphere uh, suggested to them or told them that they should be. Um, to me, it's twisted logic. I think it's irrational that it's detrimental to influence children, um, to help them think that anyone in uniform is oppressing them or is a danger to them. Um, and I think that on itself is dangerous to kids, um, not the law enforcement. So the common sense community appreciates the work of the law enforcement in our schools and on our streets to help keep things orderly and secure. And I wanna thank everyone who supports this program in our schools. Uh, yeah, when I start this, uh, you know, sometimes it's, I feel my heart pounding right now, right? Just that the, like, bigoted stuff that people say, you know, that always blaming our parents, our community, right? Blaming the, the person, you know? So, I don't know. What I want to say, though, is to me is I disagree with the presenter of this, right? The aha moment, right, is that, that data piece that uh, says that 73% of those uh, were referred to the mental health clinician and 2%, 2.7 or whatever was uh, referred to the SROs, right? So separated. So to me, I mean, I'm not a researcher, right? But just common sense seeing those numbers, right? To me says that the mental health clinician, right? Is the one that is most needed. You know what I'm saying? Um, the, the violence in the schools, you didn't really see an uptick of violence. You didn't see um, the actual need for an armed security officer, right, to get involved. Now, I think that there should be a type of campus supervisor, right? Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, a security firm or something, you know, but it just goes back to show that um, when you want to manipulate data or you want to make a, a, just a lackluster effort, of actually getting out the information, I mean, of bringing in the actual information. To me, it's just, everything was kind of, even that video, right? I appreciate the, the, the young people, you know, you know, it takes a little courage to get involved in the camera. It takes courage to come up here and speak, you know, and, and that's what we advocate for, and that's what we want, you know, for the, for the folks who start engaged, that next generation to get, get engaged, right? But to bring just a one-sided, um, conversation, especially on a video, right? That was just an Aptos, you know, Aptos High School. That was just like about 13, 14 kids, right? It's just, again, it shows the disparities between the affluent and the poor, you know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. They like move the SRO, just keep the mental health clinician and bring some type of campus supervisor or something, I don't know. Buenas noches, my name is Karina Moreno. Um, and I also want to talk about this data. There's a lot of sentiments in, in the video and from people here who are perpetuating this. Well, it's not happening to me, so it must not be bad. So I'm okay with it. 91% um, of the people surveyed had no interaction again with the SRO. I'm asking that that also be something that be changed. 
what are the students, the families who actually do have interactions with the SROs, how are they feeling afterwards? Do they feel safer? Um, and I am a researcher, so when I saw that only 2.2% of the students at Aptos and only 1.6% of the students at Watsonville High School actually had it in interaction or were refer referred solely to the SRO, that looked like a big waste of money, like it's not needed, like it's not productive. And so what would it look like if that $130 actually went into more mental health clinicians, into bringing in outside community organizations, people who've gone through the same things. I also wanna point out that this data, actually reaching out to the community, getting students and parents and staff to answer it, there was only one week, only one week to collect data. That's not enough, that's not sufficient. Um, and so I'll ask again, you know, Goal number four in the presentation for PVUSD is maintaining a balanced budget while maximizing all resources to fulfill educational priorities. I've heard students ask for a CRE contract. I've heard students ask for tutoring before school again. That sounds like a way better use of money, bringing in community organizations, increasing mental health. Nobody wants there to not be mental health. Nobody wants for students to not feel safe. But let's actually find what's actually gonna bring that not 1.2 or 2.6. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nick Baldridge. I'm a lieutenant with the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. I'm in charge of our community policing unit, which oversees our SRO program. I'm also the lead instructor for the countywide first responder active shooter training. Um, and I brought the standard command response for schools active shooter preparedness program to this county. In addition to that, um, with our SRO program, um, the sheriff's office is overall dedicated to the overall safety and security of all students and staff on our campuses. To highlight some of that, it's, it's one of those where selecting a body to be an SRO is one thing, but selecting the right person for the right position is the important thing. And that's what we do at the sheriff's office is have the right person in the right position. The person that'll call additional resources to come to campus to have a lunchtime football game, or that will start a book club for kids that recently had a lot of contacts with to promote education, to promote that connection, to having donuts on Friday because as everybody knows, the cops love donuts. Um, just to have that conversation. Um, Paul is dedicated to this program um, and we are dedicated to making sure this program succeeds. Succeeds in ways not everybody knows. Not everybody knows that Paul paid out of his pocket to have a student go through driver as, driver's ed um, so that they could get their license before they turned 18. Um, it's these connections at our schools that are important. Recently, our SROs went through the Mentors for Violence Prevention program by Dr. Ja Dr. Jackson Katz. Um, the next plan is to bring that forward to reduce bullying and gender violence um, preparation and, and, pre and prevention at our campuses. Uh, we've increased security when needed. Uh, recently, um, there was a request because of incidents at PV High, which is not in the Sheriff's Office jurisdiction, but for the overall safety, security, and dedication to this community as a whole, we sent deputies on a regular basis to stop by. Thank you. Do we have any other public speakers on this item? We have none. All right, seeing none. I will bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Dodge, Jr. Um, Mr. Starner, how many, you said at Watsonville High School we had 732 responses? For students. And all together with families and staff, how, would, how much did that come up to? Oh man, you're asking me to do mental math at this time of the or night. Um, a lot, but, but clearly not um, a full representation of our community if we take in consideration um, parents, staffs, and students and caretakers, yeah. You know, I, I hear the public saying, you know, it was only 2.6 or a certain small percentage, but what, you know, that's, that's what we came up with. You know, that's what the community said, even though it wasn't that much time, you know, I, I know, you know, Gregorio and the, the district, we, we put out 
you know, calls for please respond. And if that's the response that we got, and that's the numbers that we got. And if other groups or organizations want to come up with their own data, well, give us data. Give us your responses to the community. I live on Lincoln Street. You know, I could easily go up a block. And then, you know, most of my neighbors want SROs. And, you know, is there a place, you know, for Milpa and Barrios Unidos? Yes, there is, because I know, you know, Barrios Unidos is trying to, you know, get into EA Hall. Um, you know, I, I know Barrios Unidos is at PV. I know, you know, a representative from Milpa, you know, from this community as well. I know he has good ideas too. But until then, this is what we have. You know, um, this is the small amount of data that we have. and. You know, I know this is just a report and discussion, and I'm going to keep supporting the SRO Mental Health Coalition. You know, as the SRO CJ, you know, he's from here. You know, the Mental Health Coalition Maria, who I went to high school with, you know, there's an open door policy at Watsonville High. So, you know, Principal Gogoro, if you could kind of explain how easy it is for someone who might have an issue or not feeling well at a certain time of the day, how how does it work in Watsonville High School? Uh, so it, in a typical situation, it would be, um, so if a situation came about and a student was having an issue with another student, it's, uh, they would come either to the office and say, hey, this is going on and I feel like I'm unsafe. An administrator would uh, engage with the student if the, that was the first person or the student walks right into the office, which they have an open door policy. The, um, the SRO and Mattel sit literally right next to each other and they come in, they sit down and they just start having a conversation. So they start to dig in about uh, the situation, what's the issue, and then with the next steps being and the idea being how can we restore either relationship that's happened that's broken down between the two students, uh, an issue at home, um, and any kind of situation with always being the idea that we're going to restore or help the student. So, and that was kind of like the idea when we built out the program is that it was to always be student based and centered first, family based centered first, community based centered first. So that was kind of the idea. So that's how we built it and how it kind of works at Watsonville. So no appointments needed in any time, open door policy? Open door anytime. policy, anytime. So like I said, if it's an administrator, we bring them in. Yeah, the kids can come in. There's a popcorn machine. <laughs> so it's, it's appealing because there's a popcorn machine in there that they create um, situations where it's appealing for students to come in just to hang out. So they know that in the future, if they ever do need to come in, that it's available towards uh, for them. So if any of the trustees like to, to check it out, or even the people who don't aggress, agree with the SROs, please take a look. That's yeah, awesome. you're, you're always welcome to come by Watson High School. Uh, I have an open door policy. Um, people know if you come by and I'll take you right over there and we can talk. And um, I love showing off Watson High, especially the, the program, because we really have put a lot of work and effort into it. And, and it's, it's a team effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Turner. Uh, Trustee Bellano Scow. Yeah, thank, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all the comments. Um, do we have evidence? So we hear sometimes that the SRO is primarily there as a deterrent to some violent, tragic, wanting to avoid a tragedy. Do we have an evidence that at uh, Watsonville High or Aptos High that, that violent incidents on the campuses have, have gone down since we've had SROs on that campus, those campuses? Uh, um, even I'm not. sure that we could we could get that data. We could analyze that data and be able to bring that back. Um, but I don't know uh, the analysis of that data at this point. And do you think it's worth actually comparing PV High, which hasn't had an SRO? We've the board has allocated money, but it sounds like an SRO is coming now. With Watsonville High, which has had an SRO program, and looking at is that is that not a fair comparison to say well one school's had has it. One school doesn't. Can we look at violent incidents at each campus, and what is that not worth doing? It, it you can certainly do that. Um, what I can say about school cultures is that every school culture is different, and so um, you know we look at school culture at 
uh, PV High School um, in Watsonville High School, um, since you, you named those two. And the, the systems, the, um, the rapport, the relationships, the community that gets built at, e at each of those schools um, may look completely different. It's a different school culture. So we, we can do comparisons, but we're also looking at two separate types of, you know, two separate schools that have developed their own cultures. And, and the cultures are evolving and changing exactly. with better leadership, yep. which we've had on those campuses in recent years, thanks to our principals there who are doing a great job, in my opinion. Um, I've heard from several of our counselors that the, the pairing at Watsonville High, because of those, the way those two people work together, is the dream pairing. I've heard that from several of our counselors, that, that there's something to learn from there in the way that, that, the way that they're interacting. Also, we see at our middle schools, we have a lot of, we have a, we've had a lot of issues at our middle schools. We don't, we don't, we've had some problems there. And that we definitely want to bring in more community partners uh, to help deal with some of the, the behavior and, and violence issues there. So sometimes this gets framed uh, as either or, either or. Um, and I want to be a yes and in this, but yeah, it's real. We do have declining enrollment. There's got to be, we can't spend everything we want, but we need to have community partners on our, on, our, on our campuses, including our middle schools, in my opinion. Um, one of the top issue items in the youth survey we got, when we had a record high responses, was safety. And we've heard, I've heard at other camp, there's a concern with Watsonville High being an open campus, PV is closed, about, and I've heard from principals and administrators, a fear in the back of the mind of, of a horrific incident happening. Um, so in my mind, we need to be investing in all of these things, but I do think we need to have more data and more and more feedback from the community uh, to make our campus a safer place. It's not going to be a one silver bullet SRO, but we do need to have more mental health clinicians, in my opinion. Those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scout. Student Trustee Esquida. Thank you. Um, I wish the presentation would have come sooner, considering the board had already voted to renew the contract. Um, I'm just a little curious, specifically from the video, as to how people can access the team if a majority of the students in the video don't even know who they are. Um, so that's something I would like further clarification on. And um, I would just like to take some time to point to the budget. So I went back on the agenda and looked at the contract that was renewed on July 24th for the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office Department. The SRO contract for Aptos is around $169,000, seven, seven, uh, 406. Um, and considering in the contract, there's also um, the district paying Paul's $6,000 um, car. So I would just like some additional clarification on this contract because the breakdown here just doesn't really make sense. And considering it's a large number of um, funds from the district that are going to this contract. And specifically for the Watsonville Police Department contract, right now it's around $389,000, 280 um, annually for 180 days. Um, and in that contract, there's also not a breakdown compared to the Santa Cruz County Office, um, Sheriff's Office Department. So I just like, um, I would just like more of a breakdown for those contracts and also another survey separating the mental health clinicians and the SROs to gather that data adequately and ensuring that all student voices are heard because I know Dodd Jr. Um, touched upon, you know, the enforcement of these surveys, but I know at Aptos specifically, um, we do have something called Zone to Grow. It's a daily check-in, weekly check-in. And I think if that survey were to be enforced by teachers, because it was only sent out in an email, it wasn't enforced by teachers, um, I did take the survey. So um, I think it would be nice if we have another run at it um, with additional enforcement. Thank you. Thank you to the Trustee Esquida. Trustee Dr. Holm. Mr. Slater, thank you for the presentation. On, on slide um, 66, on, under your recommendations, under the data collection, I just wanted to clarify something where you say um, review, update, implement the student and family experience survey after each um, 
mental health clinician SRO interaction that are referral related. Does that mean that you would be gathering data from people who have been referred? Yes, so the idea would be to gather that experience data um, almost immediately after services as opposed to waiting for one time a year to call back those individuals and get that data. So um, what that does is it would allow us to um, consider that data, consider that feedback, and make adjustments um, as, we, as we move along. And is that survey the same as what this survey was? No, I think oh. it would be different. It would be different because it would be based on their experiences um, with the team and working with the team. Okay. Yeah. And, and have you considered separating out the mental health clinician and SRO questions? Is that a consideration? Y yes. Yeah. And so um, that is definitely a big consideration and would be a recommendation um, post this. Uh, we learned a lot by going through this process, right? So this is a self-study. We get to learn a lot about the program itself. We get to learn a lot about uh, the stakeholders that um, would have input on that. And so, you know, the yellow can represent a lot of different things. Um, it doesn't represent a dissatisfaction or a no, but um, as pointed out, it could represent that I'm confused. So I don't know how to answer this survey. And so, uh, but it could also mean that I really don't have a strong opinion one way or another. And it could also mean that I don't have enough information about it and I need more information. Mm -hmm. And all of those pieces of, of uh, you know, metrics that we get to take a look at inform us of how we can communicate better, how we can um, implement our systems better, and how we can ask our community um, better as well in, in making sure that, um, that, that the opinions that they have and the perceptions that they have um, is valued and that we're making sure that, um, that there's no confusion around that. Um, and just as a thought, because I, I'm, I'm hearing, you know, I'm hearing the concern about, you know, how much are we, you know, utilizing, and, and I just, it's a thought that popped into my head, and I, I hear that concern. I, when I think about what we use resources for, when I'm on a hospital unit, just as an analogy, I don't think about how many times I'm using a defibrillator if I'm going to decide whether or not I'm going to fund having a defibrillator on my unit. I'm thinking about whether or not the importance of having it available if I need it. There's definitely considerations about whether or not we may think we may need it. And that's a different conversation. But I just want us to be cautious about percentages of use as a metric for its value. That's it. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Anyone else? Yes, Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. So when we looked at putting this model in with an SRO and a mental health professional, we knew it was going to be very expensive and we had one-time dollars at the time to fund the mental, adding the mental health professional. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure we have that funding anymore, so I know that this is a big lift. But we put in the mental health professional as a way to balance the community's uh, requests for um, sort of a more just policing on our campuses. I think it's a great model to use because what we do is we prevent many, I think, bad outcomes from happening by using a crisis intervention that, um, that supports kids in need and kids that are in crisis. So I think it is a good model. I know not everybody loves it. I know sometimes law enforcement felt, or at first law enforcement felt like it was sort of having a babysitter attached to the SRO. I don't really see it that way. I just see it as helping kids in crisis. So I hope that, the, that law enforcement sees that this is viable and important on campuses. The seven of us voted in favor of supporting SRO and mental health just two meetings ago. 
And I think it's very, very important if anything should happen on campus that we have one person who could defend our staff, our teachers, our kids. So that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? All right. Seeing none, Mr. Slider, I want to thank you and your team for your work and your efforts. And I knew you were newly tasked with this. And so I thank you for being able to compile what you have brought forward and including your recommendations for the future. So I thank you and your team for your hard work this evening, going into this evening's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I will now move us to item 8.1, public comment for visitor um, non-agendized items. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items. Do we have any public speakers? Yes. Bill Beecher, Yermo Nellis, Omar Diakis, Bobby Peltz, Max Barasa, and Dr. Barasa. First of all, I owe an apology to Georgia for my comments earlier this evening. Uh, I was not aware that the bylaws had been changed in 2021 and that they weren't posted until recently. So I was unaware that it went from three minutes to two minutes. So for that, I apologize. But I want to talk about the ethnic studies contract. The board, and specifically the board president and vice president, have stood in the way of putting this on the agenda. The vote to renew the contract was one for, two against, and one abstention. Less than a majority voted to turn down the contract, and now we want to block any future discussion. This item should have been tabled at the time until at least four trustees could have decided it one way or another. What do the other trustees feel about this? Oh, George and Oscar make the decisions on what goes on the agenda, and the rest of you feel frustrated that your voices are squelched. I think you need to talk up about this in the closed sessions. Thank you. Omar Diegues, Barrios Unidos. First of all, Daniel Esqueda. Man, that's some true leadership today, man. I love the way you run it. I'm glad you're on the school board. Set the standard. I'm, I'm all for you. If I could vote you in as president right now, I would, you know? Second of all, I would, not, I would like to recognize Daniel Esqueda, Adam Bauskow, uh, and Dr. Jennifer Holm for last week for standing their ground and not walking away from the school board in their chair when a parent was here to talk about their student, their child being bullied. How dare you guys walk away from your seat when they're talking about their child getting beat up and bullied in school. Being bullied is one of the number one causes of suicide. Being bullied is one of the number one causes why students pick up guns and do mass, mass school shootings. You know? How dare you guys walk away from a parent when they're trying to express the pain that their kids is, is going through, you know? You guys took half an hour back there in a break when all you had to do is give them two minutes to express themselves. Shame. Shame. Uh, Bobby Pell, Watsonville High. <clears throat> I'm here to speak on the CRE contract. Recently, I was reading the Lookout online newspaper and I came across articles profiling all the candidates currently running for board seats in November. In those profiles, both you, Trustee Acosta, and you, Trustee Soto, were asked how you felt about the debate over renewing the CRE contract. I was surprised to read that you both said you couldn't move forward on CRE until state legislation AB 2918 was voted on. But AB 2918 was polled in mid-August, over a month ago. There is no state legislation to be concerned about. So either you lied or you were misinformed. But this has been a pattern with this board. First, there was the unfounded claim that TRE is anti-Semitic. But that allegation has been since refuted by months of testimony from teachers, students, experts, and community members. So either you lied or you were misinformed. Then we were told 
uh, that there was a concern about the cost of CRE, but CRE has already been paid for through a grant. So either you lied or you were misinformed. Then we were told that we needed to wait for the new superintendent because you needed to include her in the decision-making process. But she specifically told me that the decision is not up to her and that she acts at your direction. So either you lied or you were misinformed. And now you say that the dead legislation is the reason why we can't move forward. It has just been one excuse after another with you two. I hope you aren't lying, but then that means you're woefully misinformed. If this is how you mishandle just one issue and one contract, you should not be in charge of making big decisions on other issues in this district. I certainly don't trust you with $315 million of the public money. This board needs new leadership. Support ethnic studies. Bring back CRE. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Maximiliano Barras Hernandez, and I am a sophomore at PV. Now, I know my words will most likely fall on deaf ears. This was reaffirmed once more during the last board meeting when President Acosta all too familiarly cut off a concerned parent who cares about the well-being of his child. You say you care about the community, but what community exactly? I don't feel valued by certain members of this board who clearly are not listening to the voices of the people in this room. May I remind this board that it unanimously voted for SROs, despite having a student voice, student trustee Daniel Esqueda, posing concerns and alternative opinions on SROs. Again, he was dismissed, just like the concerned parent, and there was no further discussion on the matter, despite the immediate backlash from the community. I have to ask, who do you really represent? Soto, you've said, we need to continue our focus of transformation and empowering our community and advocating for strong representation on our school board. How can you say that when you have ignored the community for months? Acosta, you've said school safety for all students and district personnel has always been a top priority for me. Yet you didn't have two minutes to spare to listen to a parent voicing their concern for their bullied kid. Again, who do you really represent? I'm not here to speculate, so instead I will say what I know. I know people that take the position of being a public servant with more compassion than some of the members of this board. Candidates like Carol Turley for Area 2, Gabriel Medina for Area 3, and Jessica Carrasco for Area 6. They have shown time and time again that when push comes to shove, they will act in accordance to what the community needs instead of upholding the status quo. I will continue to support the candidates who have my best interest at heart. Thank you. I'm back this evening for, for two reasons. One, to personally thank trustees Dr. Holm, Scal, and Esqueda, student trustee, for the respect and time they provided during the last meeting. Thank you. I would also like to thank Amy, Iam, and Claudia Mojarras for their help. Thank you. And number two, to read my statement to the absent trustees, Acosta, Deserpa, Soto, and Superintendent Contreras, who decided to walk out for a 30-minute recess then allow me two minutes of, my time, of their time. My name is Guillermo Ornelas, and my kids are former students of, of Watson Charter School of the Arts, WCSA. I'm here tonight to bring some awareness of WCSA's principal, Amy Thomas, inconsistencies with dealing with, with student situations. There were a few incidents that occurred with one of my children, which led to believe that Amy Thomas no longer fostered a safe environment for my kids. To preserve the privacy of my child, I won't go into details of the incidents in this forum, but I make myself available to all of you if you would like to know the specifics of the incidents. One other item I would like to share tonight is the fact that WCSA Principal Amy Thomas stole $450 from me. Earlier this year in May, WCSA hosted a fundraiser and held an online auction for VIP parking for, for which I was the highest bidder. I gifted the VIP parking space to a WCSA parent who is an enormous asset to the school and my gift was not honored because I'm no longer a WCSA parent. 
and she decided to assign the parking space for teacher use. I asked for your help to encourage Amy Thomas to honor my $400 bid and my gift to the WCAC, WCSA family of my choice. Thank you. I am going to donate my time to Ms. Booker because she has something really important to share that I feel, I don't know if she's gonna get called on, I don't wanna risk it, so I'm gonna give her my time. Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you for this. Um, good evening to all of the board. Good evening to everyone here. My name is Mink Brooker, and I am a special ed uh, teacher at uh, Pajaro Valley High School, but I'm also the Black Student Union advisor at Pajaro Valley High School. I came here because I wanted to share with everyone that on November 14th, Again this year, Pajaro Valley High School would love to invite everyone to be able to participate in, well, thank you. <laughs> wow. In the Ruby Bridges Walk to School event. We made history last year by being the first high school to do this. And all across the nation, hundreds, probably thousands of educational institutions celebrate Ruby Bridges and her uh, bravery at six years old, uh, being escorted into an all white school uh, by federal marshals. And she, Ruby Bridges is still alive. She just celebrated her 70th birthday. So hopefully our second annual walk to school will be this November 14th, 2024 and School board, I ask you all to possibly think about having the whole district um, become involved with this. Our stellar uh, admin, uh, led by Todd Wilson, we have a Heidi Story, we have a new assistant principal, Mr. Isidro, I believe, and Ms. Chavez. Um, Mr. Wilson has suggested maybe we walk across the bridge and come into the school Ms. Contreras wants to make sure we have uh, some news presence. And I even tried to contact Ruby Bridges herself. So I haven't heard back from their team yet, but I just wanted to announce to everybody that hopefully PVUSD will participate in our second annual walk to school event for Ruby Bridges. Thank you for giving me this time. Next group, Takashi Misuno, Isel Barraza, Mark Mendoza, Maria Garcia, Eli Davies, and Laura Coomer. Konbanwa, uh, I'm Takashi, and next Monday is Indigenous People's Day. And, oh, thank you. I have researched American Indian farm worker families who em emigrated to Pajaro Valley since 1840s. I have not been able to do my research without support of this family, Patrick Orozco's family. His family has lived in Pajaro Valley since 1850s. And this photo is, uh, this lady is, uh, uh, Maria Dixon Marquez. She is Chumash and Irish. And they lived uh, and worked in James Water Ranch in, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the street. Oh yeah, anyway, they lived in Wassonville and worked uh, in, uh, in the ranch for almost 20 years between 18, 1908 and around 1917. And this, this lady is uh, her second daughter. Her name is uh, Teresa. Teresa came back to Pajaro Valley 
uh, in the late 1930s, and they lived and worked in the McGrath's uh, ranch at the foot of Mount Madonna. And they, uh, yeah, and anyway, uh, this is uh, Mary Ann. Uh, she's one of uh, Teresa's grandniece. She's now mayor of uh, Sand City next to uh, <coughs> Seaside City. And she became the first American Indian mayor in California. And she initiated to change the name of Columbus Day to Indigenous Day. And we are going to have Indigenous People's Day next Monday in Santa City. Oh, I don't have time. So <laughs> anyway, uh, we are going to do this kind of presentation in several school, several classes at uh, Cabrillo College <laughs> next year. Anyway, thank you. I have only two minutes, so I can't. Hello, my name is Ishin. Why am I here? The only people I feel heard by are Daniel, our student trustee, trustee Scow, and trustee Holm. I'm constantly ignored by the others. I write my thoughts and concerns on this, on the, I write my thoughts and concerns on these speeches, and I come here to speak just to be, to, just to be ignored. I'm sorry, but a giant campaign signs with your name on them don't shield your neglect and disregard of our people. Everyone here knows what you've done and what you have been doing. No amount of big signs and money will hide how poorly you've treated this community. We will remember in November and vote against you. We will spread the word and make sure you are kicked off the school board. Now, I want to address what happened during the last board meeting. You shut down a parent's concerns. This is very contradictory to what you have said, Acosta. You've said, and I quote, school safety for all our students and district personnel has always been a top priority for me. Is it really though? If you really cared about the safety, you would have, lis you would have listened to your community, you would have listened to the community you represent. You wouldn't avoid every concern you face. Bring back Siri. Next speaker, please. My name is Eli. I use they, them pronouns. I'm in Area 7. Because I am concerned with information being true, I want to clear up some misconceptions that we've heard within these chambers. The call for CRE is a call for a contract with a consultant who provided training to teachers. We understand ethnic studies still exists, but it should concern everyone in this meeting about our school district that a full year ago, this training was canceled and no support or additional training has been given to teachers in all that time. Ethnic studies will be a graduate requirement, and the situation as we are seeing it is a massive failure in leadership to address the students' needs. Secondly, the money for CRE came from a grant. Any concern about the use of money on the CRE contract is either misguided or lying. We didn't actually coordinate about this. It's just the truth. As I understand it, teachers are now being directed to spend that money in any way possible because that grant money is intended to be used. I reiterate, this is a massive failure in leadership for our students. Third, this administration framing hesitation about CRE in regards to legislation such as AB 2918 is false. Sebastian Aguilar, a representative from Representative Zabur's office, said the bill shouldn't affect the district's decisions on CRE. Additionally, according to an EdSource article, Zabur and Addis agreed not to apply the bill to already approved courses. And finally, with my last 30 seconds, it's last minute, but I want to address the sentiments expressed earlier during the SRO comments. Um, they were using whiteness in a way that uh, as, as a white person, like I felt the way it was meant to be intimidating. And I think it's incredibly wrong and mean-spirited to bring that into this space.
Um, hi, my name is Laura Coomer, and I'm the parent of a seventh grade student at Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. Um, I would like to share with you how much this school community has meant to my son and my family, but not to discount the struggles that have been put forth before me, and those are struggles of friends of my son as well. Um, but my son has dyslexia and ADHD and has always struggled to focus and learn in school. We have tried four different school settings until we found WCSA. Each of the teachers has worked through creative um, approaches to help my son grow. For example, the resource teacher, Kendra Lynn Morley, <laughs> um, knew that my son loved animals, and so she brought him to her farm to bond with her pigs and goats, even selling us a pig to raise at our own place. Principal Amy Thomas has also taken her own personal time to invest in my son. She knows my son loves to bicycle, and she hooked him up with her older son, who introduced him to his favorite mountain biking trails in the county. The seventh grade year has been the year I have been most proud to be part of the WCSA community. This year, my son, along with some of his friends, have been having a particularly hard time focusing in class and being respectful to teachers, friends, and community. In order to, to address this gr group of children, Ms. Rebel, his hardworking and amazing teacher, who's here, along with Ms. Thomas, the principal, put together a restorative justice circle composed of these boys, their families, all of this on their own time in the evening. My son had never been a part of a community discussion like that, where he was being held responsible amidst the families and friends he has grown up with his whole life. It was powerful for him. I saw him listen to the criticisms and the words of wisdom with an open heart. At the end of the meeting, the boys signed a contract that outlined behaviors they were expected to change and also outlined consequences. And the final consequence would be expulsion if they could not stop the behaviors. So I've seen each of these students grow, and I'm grateful for the school. There are also many parents and teachers here from the school who might want to stand to show their support as well. OK, next group, uh, Chris Webb. Uh, forgive me if I pr pronounce your name wrong. Monica Sunzri. Gabriel Beretta, Brandon Dinitz, Judy Baker, and Carrie Vicetta. Uh, I wanted to briefly follow up on my point about the, from 3.4 and just say that that uh, ally, um, just so you know, I had texted him in the middle of the meeting um, after my comment w was denied. So for that reason, I think he was rather justified when... Um, even though if I maybe didn't always agree with some the, the way some things were said, he, his actual comments were justified. Um, also, I wanted to also just generally reflect on last meeting. Um, the term like circus came up, and I, I'm somewhat inclined to agree, but then I'm also inclined to say like it, that kind of, in my eyes, makes the board president and, and um, another person who started the CRE thing, Barnum and Bailey. So, the like... Partly, I also say that because, you know, you had that special board meeting to do the governing values, but for, obviously, people for a long time have been asking, just put it on the agenda. And so by choosing not to do that, you create all this um, tension and, like, negativity. And then you have these meetings where you start, um, you know, creeping into even more anti-democratic things. And... Of course, of course, people are going to like respond. So I think we need to like have a little self-awareness here. Um, also, one thing I think we should consider with the um, back to the SRO thing is our parents, there, there should be data on this. Are parents more likely to press charges if there's an SRO? Now would be a great time to see about that because we have the control of PV High so we could see. Like, are people, are, if they have the SRO there, will they go to the police more? I know um, I saw the police more at Renaissance after we, like, lost our normal support systems and we just went to, like, well, there's SROs. I felt like there was a lot of times where we were missing early signs. And um, one of those signs was when a kid made an issue of a phone and he hit a teacher. And then, like, last week, last Friday, that kid um, perished. So we need to like realize these are serious issues and we should get to serious systemic approaches. Thank you. Yeah. 
Good evening. My name is Gabriel Barraza. I think Gabriel Barrera was called, but I mispronounced my name. Okay. So um, I'm here again to advocate for renewing the CRE contract. I've been coming here for over a year and uh, trying to get that, you know, the board to rethink their decision. Um, ethnic studies is not just studying your culture and your history. It's the study of how systems of power are used and distributed in societies. There are people who have advantages and people who have disadvantages. Every one of us, every one of us carries advantages and disadvantages. It's how we use the power and the privilege that we have that makes society function well or makes it difficult for others. That's what ethnic studies teaches. It's not about anti-Semitism or anti-white or anything like that. It's about learning your place in society and how to improve society collectively. And again, systems of power do not like collective action. That's why people are anti-union because unions band together and demand better wages, better conditions. Now, I also wanted to address a comment that was made about the responsibility of school boards and transportation and some comments about educating yourself. We know that school boards are not responsible for transportation. We also know that trustees have power in the community. And if a person is a community servant and a public servant, that they will use that position of power to advocate for people in their community so that they will have sidewalks to get to school. It's not your decision, but it's your responsibility to advocate. Hello, good evening. My name is Monica Sinzeri, and I'm here because I am a parent as well as a staff member at WCSA. And after hearing about the negative things that were said about our school at the last board meeting, I felt uh, like it would be only right to give an example of my family's experience. We are not a perfect school, but what I love about WCSA is that we are a family, a community that strives to cultivate an environment of respect, integrity, and kindness. This is one of the many reasons I wanted to work here. My kids are happy at school. They feel safe. They love their, the staff there and their friends. They feel welcomed, seen, and cared for by all of their teachers, as well as Amy Thomas, their principal. Like I said before, as, uh, as a school, we are far from perfect. I don't believe any school is, but a school that truly strives to be better, one whose staff is truly committed to serving all of its students is special, and that's what I see and how I feel as a parent as well as a staff member at WCSA. Thank you. Uh, Brandon Denise, uh, lifelong Dodger fan. We won 8 nothing tonight, so there we go, forcing game five against, um, against San Diego. Um, I wanted to read a poem to you, so please forgive me if I go a few seconds over. The poem is um, Deaf Nation by one of my favorite artists, Serge Tankian. The dangers of opening up politically to emphasize with the empire may be apparent to the emperors of the modern globalist geopolitical stronghold. Those that only shake the fence with hatred in their emotionally reactive minds marginalize their own potency and we are left alone. As they are reduced or rendered harmless, there is no one side to blame for the totality of the tragic human drama. Since our voices don't reach the threshold of the ears of justice and our powerful silence gives way to blind consent, the poems of Haviz, Rumi, Kabir, Lao Tzu, and the, verse, the verses of Emerson, Thoreau, and Whitman are all but unheard in the inflamed hearts of men today. Aggressive expression takes precedence over the hymns and hums of the Gayoto monks and the sacred chants in times desperate for redefinition and dire need of reason in a truly deaf nation. I wanted to read that because I couldn't sleep last night, so I just popped open a book and started to reading poems. But I, I feel like that's what's happening here. There's a lot of aggression, but it's falling on deaf ears. So as a school board, you have an added burden of responsibility to make people feel heard, 
to reduce that barrier so that we're not feeling like we're screaming into the void. And a little bit of action can really go a long way. So I would encourage you to reconsider your stance on limiting public comments and just listen. And all you have to do is sit there and listen. And I think you'll see that some of the anger and aggression and passion that we feel is lessened. And we can lower the rhetoric and start solving problems. So please listen. My name is Judy Baker. I'm a mother of a kinder and third grader at WCSA, a local business owner, a co-business owner, and co-president of Home and School Club, and a volunteer yard duty. Why is there so much teasing at school? I think there are three reasons. Staff is outnumbered and the students know it. As a yard duty, it's hard to see all angles of an argument and create consistent consequence. You can't send the students home for teasing because students have the right to be at school. Uh, one or two, low parent participation. The law passed in 2015 by the California Department of Education, removing the requirement of volunteer hours in charter schools has created a low volunteer rate. Three, in seventh grade, I think the issue is the start of puberty, regressing, uh, regressing sometimes to behaviors of first graders. As a volunteer yard dirty, I've seen first graders use bad language and puff their chests up. It's the same behavior I see in first grade. I took the threat of, uh, of a fight seriously and I stood between the seventh graders. To my surprise, the second the bell rang, signaling the end of the break, they were friends walking to class laughing. These issues are not the fault of the students who have the right to public education. So what do we do? As a parent of a socially challenged third grader, I say volunteer. If you get frequent calls from the school about child, your child teasing or hurting other students, or your child comes home with tearful tales of teasing, volunteer is a yard duty. Come to campus, campus with an open mind and open heart. Get to know the, the school community your student belongs to. Listen and observe objectively. You might find your child is both the victim and the aggressor at times. Our children are interacting and learning social skills with children who they themselves are building social skills. I'm sorry, one more sentence if you would. Would you send your child to a piano teacher who is still learning to play piano? Be the positive grown-up and learn from... Uh, and let them, you know, be the, excuse me, be the example. That's all. Thank you. All right. And uh, last speaker is Miguel. Forgive me once again if I mispronounce your last name. I'm, I'm going to guess it's Tavera. He's gone. And that is all. All right. Thank you. Seeing that that is all, we will now move to item nine, employee organization comments. Now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. We will start with 9.1 PBFT, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Do we have anyone here to speak on their behalf? Yes, we do. And do we have any public comments on 9.1? Yes, we have three. All right, Angela Rabal, Bobby Marshall, and Bill Beecher. So what's going to come first? We'll let the speakers come up, and then you'll have your. OK, this is different. Thanks. Hello there. My name is Angela Rebel. And as a PVFT um, member and a teacher at WCSA, I just wanted to share that I begin my day. I begin my day at the Breakfast Club. I spend it there at 7 a.m., a program started by Amy Thomas, our principal, when the um, ELOP money and funding changed that she valued as something, a way to keep our kids uh, safe and our parents who needed this extra care. She started, she employed me for the breakfast club there. Then 
Uh, it's, after that, I work throughout the day as a seventh grade teacher. I am a seventh grade teacher, very familiar with the situation, and I spend my time as I'm teaching math, science, and advisory, trying to shape these kids. I'm the athletic director, and I also work in the after school program. So I'm very familiar with the WCSA program, and this is my first time sharing this experience with all of you, so thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, ultimately, I wanted to get across that I know our students, I know our parents, because I spend hours there at a time. And I'm in a place where relationships are fostered and appreciated. And I'm here today because I was both surprised and bothered when the situation at the last meeting came up discussing our school WCSA and my community. I, um, my job is to keep everyone safe. And my job is to go and protect my beloved school, but also to have a voice for people who don't always have a voice in the setting. Freedom of speech is very important, yes. And having multiple points of view and having other people have a voice to share the stories is too. So that is why I'm here, to give the students who were not represented there a voice, as well as to give uh, my principal, Amy Thomas, a voice. WCSA is one of the few schools that is at capacity during a climate of declining enrollment. People choose to go there and want to be there. It's not a perfect place, but it is a place people choose to be. They do not have to be. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to the board for coming to visit. Sorry, I'm wordy. Hey there, Bobby March Assault, a proud PVFT member, uh, teacher and parent, WCSA. I would love to, I'm just kind of curious if there's a reason that we've changed the order of the or, uh, employee organizations. It's thrown us, I'm just curious. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get much of a chance to, to say, Jen, you know, Dr. Holm, sorry, I'm going to miss you. Uh, let you know how, how much I will miss you. So, And you kind of stole my thunder because I was going to say that I work at WCSA, uh, the worst school in the district except for all the others, right? Now, not because I actually think we're better than anybody else. It's a bad dad joke, but it brings up the, the, the point that, you know what? We all love our communities that we work in and uh, you know we all have our issues, right? None of us are perfect. Um, you know, our teachers and our administrators work hard to care for our students and parents in the surrounding community and are the front lines of working with students with education as far as academics as well as behavior. Um, you know, as you can imagine, it's been a difficult couple of weeks at our site. Some strong accusations were made and continue to be made, um, and then unfortunately amplified in ways on social media. Without due process, it's social media age, I guess I get it. But it's given us an opportunity to share with a lot of you through email some stories, a lot of our families. I know that Miguel Tavera and also uh, uh, Cal Becerra were hoping to be here but had to leave because it's gotten so late. But there are great stories. And uh, I want to thank you for the work you've been doing to look into uh, this concern. I, it does concern me that somebody who is an educator uh, would come and share some of the uh, personal uh, names and also in a community where we know we're talking about who would label, uh, even if I had a problem with a student, I would never label a young Latino student who hasn't had any violent history as somebody who might bring a weapon to school. Um, so that concerns me, but I'm glad that you were looking into it. And please continue to, uh, we appreciate your support. I do want to, uh, I believe you all have our absolute best interest of everybody involved. And I thank you for that. And I just ask that my one concern has been as teachers, we have not been approached and we would like to be a part of the conversation as we are the ones who know what's happening. So please come and talk to us. Thank you so much. I'm stoked to be a part of our community. Oh, and please come visit. You can come in my room and play bucket drums and sing with us. All right, please come. Good evening again. Uh, PVFT is a wonderful resource that you guys aren't taking into consideration. You realize we're losing 600 students a year. That's a one elementary school. Every year, another elementary school disappears, but it doesn't. You've got a thousand teachers out there who are wondering when the hell are you guys gonna talk about what you're gonna do with our schools? Are you going to start closing some? It affects them. They should have some comments for you. If you just open it up and put it on the agenda, we've got to figure out 
how the hell we're going to start reducing the number of schools. We're going to be down 42% by the end of this decade. You've got to start closing some schools. And you need PVFT to be part of that discussion. Otherwise, they're sitting out there scared as hell because you're not doing anything. Thank you. I just left a controlling uh, relationship, so I, I understand this game. <laughs> so, good evening. Um, <laughs> my name's Nelly Vaquera, president of PVFT. Uh, all right, so I'll start with some positives. I do want to say thank you to Dr. Contreras for uh, being very inclusive and wanting to ensure that she is communicating with us. Um, we have some, I think she's learning that I, I don't sugarcoat things. Um, I think a lot of people don't, might not know that I actually make the same salary I would make if I were in the classroom. I just get to work more days and more hours. Um, and so, you know, for me as our elected leader, as, as the elected leader, I, I believe that Dr. Contreras is realizing that when I speak um, from the perspectives from the many units that we represent, that it's not exaggerated, because I don't have time for that. Um, so in reference to the, the um, very like quick turnaround on gathering data. Oh, he's not here anymore. Mr. Slider put together. Um, and then just the comments on it. I One of the things that I want to get clarified is um, what is it? So I think it was um, you, Dr. Holm, that had mentioned it, like, you know, or maybe it was uh, Ms. Serpa that just what is it, this, this it, this thing that to lead to safety? Because this is what I heard. I heard that... Um, there's a need for conflict resolution. I heard um, that there is um, the importance of connections with our students. I heard that what, um, what we need is for crisis intervention. And what I see is we have some wonderful counselors and some great mental health clinicians, and we can have more. We're currently working with the district and their sustainable budget committee and um, I'm really hoping that this, this conversation will, will be part of that committee to attend to those budget concerns because we are having to really think about how we're investing and who we're investing in for our students. And yeah, we do have declining enrollment in some of our sites, but we're also gonna uphold that we want our neighborhood schools because our neighborhoods, just as Mr. Slider had said, our schools are very unique in their school community, in the school community, in the school culture, uh, that's because our our neighborhoods are very unique as well. So we're going to uphold that our community maintain their schools. So how do we redefine how we're utilizing these spaces for our students? How do we um, reevaluate how we're investing? And if we want safe spaces for our students then let's invest in those mental health clinicians. Let's invest in those counselors. Like I shared last time, we have social emotional counselors who are split between two elementary, elementary sites. Why not have one elementary social emotional counselor at each dedicated for each of our 16 elementary sites? You are now investing in that learning community of students and their young minds to begin to sort through those various issues that they're com conflicted with. And they have now a person who's there all day, every day to help guide them through those, those um, decision making, guide them through how to calm themselves, how to sort through that, um, modeling those conversations, maybe in, in small groups. That's where that investment should be. And it's not as expensive as uh, three police officers. Um, 
Again, I don't have anything against police officers because I actually have law enforcement in my family. Um, so that's what I'm hoping for as we continue to work forward with Dr. Contreras, as she's in, you know, still in under six months of, <laughs> of uh, you know, working while students are on campuses. And it's been positive. And I really do hope that we have board members who are no longer not serving our community and blocking our superintendent from working forward with us and, and our other stakeholders. Thank you. 9.2, California School Employees Association, CSEA. Do we have anyone here from CSEA? We do not. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Well, Chris, you've submitted a speaker card. Yes, I wanted to congratulate Gus on his election appointment, new position. Um, I know last year he made a comment here. He brought the, the team from Watsonville High and um, to much fanfare. One, one of the things that he said to me really stuck out to me, and it was, um, we give hand ups, not handouts. And at the time, that, that really hit me because um, that I had that's like a shared value. And it reminded me of uh, one of the things that was happening at Renaissance just last year was um, the loss of our variable credit system. And I felt like that was a system where you it was very merit-based and it encouraged people to, to do their best. And as we have these discussions about declining um, attendance, uh, I think like that's if you, I would, I would actually ask you guys to research this. I, I bet you, if you were to review the attendance data from the 1819, the model continuation renaissance, versus let's say 23, 24, where you had no more variable credit and no progress monitoring system, I, I think you'd probably find that some of these, these proven stakeholder informed systems have actually served the community, the students, um, our values, our stated values better. Um, also, another thing I want to make sure that would be on Gus's radar is I had emailed um, the previous president um, because l last year when there was a, a change and like the teachers didn't have to do as much adjunct duty and that put more burden on the CSEA members at Renaissance and they were actually operating outside of their job descriptions. Um, in some cases where they, they like they, they, this I feel like contributed to like a safety concern. Also, it kind of put CSEA members in a weird space of where they might face uh, different liability. I know there was a, a complaint that one teacher had with, with one because of this um, weird positioning. So I feel like um, I would like him to just be aware of that and let's make sure we work together. Two unions, thank you. Moving to 9.3, Communication Workers of America, CWA, the Substitutes Teachers Union. Do we have anyone here for CWA? Good evening. Welcome, Mr. Floor. Good evening, board. President Acosta, Dr. Contreras, this is Mike Floor. I'm here to uh, speak on behalf of Communication Workers of America, CWA, the union that represents the substitutes of our district. Um, I've been very busy lately. As a steward, I'm getting calls weekly, sometimes more than one, with situations that happen at sites. And I've learned a bunch, so I've been able to answer their questions. People are very happy to have a union representing them and clear communication, um, an issue that came. So I've, I've mentored a few younger subs with regards to their status with long-term jobs whether they continue after the 30 days or not, there's been a few people that have called me. And um, came to my attention from a concerned colleague substitute that there was a pathway to become a substitute without a BA or passing the CBEST test. It was pretty concerning. Um, I talked to a few people that are sitting up there about it and did some investigating and found out that there actually is a way for someone to start subbing before they graduate, but they have to be at a four-year university and they have to have at least 90 units. So it's kind of a way to get started early and it's a credential, uh, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing thing. It's not a PVUSD thing. So that was great to know for future consideration. 
And um, Brian Saxon was very, very informative and transparent about that. I appreciated communicating with him, me and him establishing a rapport. So Brian, thank you if you're watching this or when you watch this later. And then he informed me that there he's working on creating a pathway for career substitutes. So substitutes that have been in the district for two years and have worked at least 90 days can get certified as a career sub. And if they take a long-term job, they won't be limited to the 30 days. That was brand new. That came to my attention earlier this week. And then, um, so learning these things is great. And um, I'm happy to put the effort in for that because it's improving the landscape for substitutes. With that being said, that's kind of like the new business. Last week, I came up here and there was something that I forgot to bring up and I want to bring it up tonight. Um, the, the condition of our receivership with CWA. We've been a receivership for four years. We've had Louis Rocha and Nancy Biagini be asked by the Washington DC chapter to come out of retirement, to take no more than three years to try to put a local back together and get us out of receivership. I know a couple of you are disappointed when we couldn't endorse you through CWA because of the receivership. So I wanted to let you know that we are about to get out of receivership. There are elections for our local in San Jose that are happening in a couple weeks. And we're gonna have a new president, we're gonna have a new board. And Nancy and Louie are gonna to get to go back into retirement. So you might see some people come up here that aren't me, which will be kind of nice to have a little bit of support. The whole audience left right before I was gonna come up and talk, I was gonna compliment how this board meeting felt a lot more productive, a lot more positive, and I don't feel sick to my stomach like I did last week because I really felt the emotions in the room and it was kind of a letdown, that's why I got distracted. I didn't say everything I wanted to because that half hour recess just kind of threw me off, kind of tilted me. I'm dealing with a pretty intense family dynamic right now and uh, it's happening today. I'm not even sure exactly what the results of. My dad had a surgery, and I've been focused since 5.30 this morning on other things. And um, I just wanted to let you know that one of the e-board positions at the local, I was nominated for that. So I'm actually on the ballot. And I have an election coming up too. <laughs> so just wanted to let you know that that's the state of our union right now. And I'm hoping in a month that we will be met all the requirements to get out of receivership so we can have local representation. That might inspire some people from PVUSD to step up and come to these, and it won't always just be me. So as always, I'm very appreciative that you allow me to come up and talk to you, and I, uh, I'm very appreciative. And also, oh, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Floor, and best of thoughts with you and your family and your father. Um, 9.4, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers, Pavam. Do we have anyone here from Pavam? Good evening, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Contreras. On behalf of Pavam and the ent entire Pavam committee, We'd like to extend our deepest gratitude to trustee Dr. Holm for your service as a member of the board, your kind and fair leadership, as well as your calm and thoughtful presence. You have made a lasting impact on PBUSD. Your ability to navigate challenges with grace and balance um, has fostered a collaborative spirit. We thank you. Board, I'd also like to thank you for your ongoing support of our attendance campaign, which you're all now familiar with. You can't achieve your dreams if you don't show up to chase them. I'm here tonight to spotlight lots of people who are showing up. On that note, we have an excellent turnout, both from administrators and parents at our recent PBUSD parent conference. The title was Rise and Shine, It's Back to School Time. Our family engagement team did an outstanding job organizing and creating a meaningful day for all participants. 
I won't name every individual because I'm afraid I might forget somebody, but I want to acknowledge the collaboration of site and district administrators who supported, greeted, and gave presentation to parents. Dr. Contreras kicked off the day highlighting our attendance campaign, and then Dr. Ferris Sabah spoke. Special thanks to Mike Berman and Chrissy McLean for spearheading this event, planning, and execution. The successful conference is just the first of many that we'll be hosting throughout the year. The parents showed up and our students for our students, and it was a fantastic day. Next, I want to share some of the things that the Student Support Services Department and Pavan members have been doing. Louise Burnside and I presented during the parent engagement on parent rights. Maria Ferrara, our principal at Duncan Holbert, organized an incredible back to school night without, with um, standing room only attendance. She also launched monthly trainings for parents. She just finished a four month or four week training on potty training for our preschoolers. It was wonderful. Additionally, our special education community advisory committee was had unprecedented involvement, several parents attended the first meeting and nine of those volunteered to join and be on the CIC board. I will be bringing names forward in one of our meetings. So our next CIC meeting is October 22nd from six to seven. Ben Slider has continued to provide monthly training for site administrators and staff around climate and culture. The purpose of the climate and culture meetings is to collaborate, explore, learn and develop tier one strategies to enhance our school's climate and culture. Nicole Salas Cunha led one of her professional development strands and that was attended both by elementary and secondary teachers, strategies for supporting diverse learners in the classroom. These sessions were well attended and general and special education teachers and we'll be, we'll be building on this topic with three more PD days. Maria Fernandez is supporting the district's district-wide attendance campaign, working on supporting students and families and sharing data at our, to our leadership. The last, one of the last emails, I don't think it was the last one, so um, we celebrated Valencia Elementary School, Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, Rolling Hills, and Aptos High School um, were all recognized for their outstanding attendance. Um, Heather Morin has been integral in creating support systems that were shared with principals at our last MTSS learning session, and then we'll work with the school psychologist on how best to support tier one strategies throughout all of our school sites. And last, Mark Wensler continues to ensure our staff has the opportunity to be trained in safety care. The training is focused on strategies um, staff can use to de-escalate students when big feelings and behaviors arise. He recently completed a recertification session reinforcing um, this commitment. Thank you for all of your work with us. Thank you. All right, and I will now move us to um, item 10, our consent agenda. Consent items, these are items that are routine items before the board. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? We do not. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Trustee Dr. Holm. Uh, 10.6, please. So I move to approve the consent agenda item, pulling item 10.6. Okay. I have a first for that. Can I have a second? Second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 7-0. 10.6 has been deferred. Um, Trustee Dr. Holm, would you like to start with that? Um, yes, I just was wondering um, with that, because I remember when, we, when it was last brought to the board, we, there was a lot of discussions about the surface of that play area, and I, I just wanted to follow up and find out where that was at. I know there's been so much back and forth, I don't even know if, we, if that's set anymore. <laughs> Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras, board members. My name is Erlindo and Fernandez and I'm the Director of Maintenance and Operations. Re regarding your question, we are moving, we're looking into putting in some 
It's not going to be wood chips. Okay. So we're the proposal is calling for um, what is that? Pour it in place. Pour in place. Pour in place. Yes. Moving forward with pour in place. Okay. Great. Um, I, I just wasn't. Thank you. I was just wondering if that was the direction we were headed, and I. So that was my only question about okay. that. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge everybody. The, I, I feel like the design should be a roller coaster because this project has. <laughs> yeah, um, and I just want to thank the team, um, and everybody at the county level, and the, especially the Rio de Mar Parent Alliance for advocating for this. It's 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 really important to the community. I mean, um, so so thank you, and I'd like to move to approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. I have a first. Can I have a second? I have a second, and I have a couple of comments. Sure. I want to thank the leadership of Jim Black um, for bringing this to our um, attention. Um, I believe that if Measure M passes, there might be actually more money for this project. And I know that Measure K is now unembargoed up at, sorry, my voice, I'm losing my voice, up at the county level. And so there might be more um, money there for parks too. So hoping that we can um, help even further with this project and get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Any further comments? All right, seeing none, I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now we will move to item 12, our action items. And I'll move us to 12.1 selection of a date to hold a special board meeting for trustee area 7 interviews. This report will be presented by me, Georgia Acosta, president of the PVUSD Governing Board of Directors. Um, so district staff um, has respectfully requested that we set this special board meeting for the trustee area seven interviews for Monday, October 21st at 6 p.m. That is my report on this item. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. All right, see none. I will bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any questions? Yes, Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to support the date you suggested. Monday, October 21st at 6 p.m.? Yes. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. I have a first. Is there any other questions, comments, or deliberation? Monday, 21st, October 21st at 6 p.m. No, at uh, Towers. Mm -hmm. Do I have a second? Is that a second, Trustee Scow? Bolana Scow? Okay, so I have a first and I have a second. All those in any further questions, comments, or deliberation? Okay. I'll, I'll be abstaining. Sure. Um, so I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Um, opposed? Abstaining? Me. <laughs> okay. So that will carry 601. All right. Thank you, you all. Um, now we will move to 12.2, Williams Quarterly Report for July, August, and September 2024. This report will be presented by our Interim Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Dr. Angelica Renteria. Good evening, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Contreras. My name is Angelica Renteria, and I'm the Interim Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. I'm here tonight to present on the Williams Quarterly Report. All school districts are required to adopt a complaint system as part of the Williams Settlement. On a quarterly basis, Williams complaints must be reported to the board and to the county superintendent. The report must include the number and type, types of complaints received and how they were corrected. The district received zero complaints re related to facilities, instructional materials, and teacher misalignments during the first quarter of the 24-25 school year. I respectfully request 
your approval of this report. Thank you, Ms. Ventredi. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yeah, we have one, Chris Webb. Uh, yes, I was wondering if I could actually get some clarity. When I when I moved to Watsonville High, my biggest concern there was about the, the HVAC situation. And um, I'm wondering, like, is there uh, a temperature at which that would be like a justifiable Williams complaint? Um, last week, pretty much my entire department spent several days um, from the, the mellow, thank goodness, it's, it was there to like save us and it wasn't being used or anything. But, uh, and also thank you to my department chair for, and, and to the site admin for helping accommodate. Um, but I think if like excellence is a priority, then that's something we need to, to address. And I'm, I'm glad to see we have Measure M on the ballot. I feel like a way to, that is, I agree with you, Daniel Dodge, that should, should go through. Um, thank you for bringing up this issue for a long time. Um, I think one way that would make it easier for everyone to get behind this is like every time we have a measure like this, we just all, you know, always plan on a PLA agreement. Thank you, um, Trustee Scow, for bringing that up at the last meeting. Uh, also, thank you for getting the, um, the free speech issue correct last meeting also. Uh, when I tell people over the hill about the, the no AC situation, they're, they're a little bit shocked. Um, I think like a, maybe a simple solution kind of going by the district office, I feel like it would help a lot, um, to even, I know HVAC is going to be a huge thing. What if for like a smaller thing, you just had awnings of solar panels? I know a teacher on my hallway set, came in and you're, oh, you're only at like 83, I'm at 87. And it's because the nature of where my room is located, it had a slightly more shade because of um, just the structure of it. So possibly that's a way we can like get something done sooner. And maybe even when there is HVAC, you won't even need to run it as much because of that um, reduced solar radiation. Thank you. All right, I will bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? Trustee Dodge Jr. Yeah, I'd just like to thank the speaker, Chris Webb, hopefully your colleagues at Watsonville High, you're, support this measure and you know hopefully we could count on their support instead of bashing us and you know come out and support measure M. Plenty of opportunities to walk right Dr. Contreras so thank you. Thank you trustee Dodge Jr. Anyone else? Seeing none all right. Oh, I have a sure. comment. Sure. So just Let's for clarification the code for maintaining a temperature is a minimal of 68 degrees. So if you're above 68 degrees, then per code, you're okay. Thank you, Vice President Trustee Soto. All right, any other questions, comments, or deliberation from the board? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve? I can make a motion to support this agenda. I'll second. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any um, opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 7-0. We'll now move us to 12.3, approval of the resolution 24. Yes, and thank you, Ms. Renteria, sorry. To, now to 12.3, approval of resolution 24-25-08, education protect. Education Protection Account EPA for 24-25 school year, and this report will be presented by our CBO, Ms. M. Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent Dr. Contreras, and Board of Trustees. My name is Jenny M, and I am the Chief Business Officer, and I'm here to um, respectfully request the approval of Resolution 24-2508 for the 2425 Education Protection Account. This is an annual resolution that is brought to board. Um, the Education Protection Account was approved under Prop 30 back in 2012. It was a temporary um, increase in uh, sales and use tax for four years, and then a temporary increase then in income tax for high income earners um, for another seven years. Um, then Prop 55 extended um, this tax through 2030. In maintaining fiscal transparency, 
Uh, the Board of Education is required to make this funding determinations um, each year in open session of a public meeting. Um, the funds received from EPA cannot be used for any administrative costs. Um, based on the allowable uses, um, the district uh, recommends to allocate these funds on teacher salaries and benefits, um, thus satisfying the requirements um, imposed by um, Article 13, Section 36 of the state constitution. Thank you, Ms. Sam. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board um, for questions, comments, and deliberation. Any deliberation from the board? I'll move to approve. I have a motion to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. Any other deliberation from the board before I call for a vote? All right, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? See none, that will carry 7-0. Thank you, Ms. Thank Amy. you. And now I will move us to item 13, um, report and discussion items. Item 13.1, the board governance handbook. This report will be presented by me, Georgia Acosta, board president. So I would like to present another section of the new newly developed board governance handbook. This handbook, again, was developed over the summer of 2024 together with the Board of Education as well with um, Superintendent Dr. Heather Contreras and a consulting firm. And for tonight's meeting, I will review the following protocols for becoming a member of the governance team. And I'm going to just highlight the bold parts of this um, as this has been readily available since um, August for a review. So protocols for becoming a member of the governance team. Um, we have an outline of vacancies on the board and how those are filled. We have an outline for orientation for new school board candidates and how that is to occurs. And then we have the welcoming of new board members to the board. And those are the three highlighted areas um, for this evening. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have one. Mr. Denitz. Button. There we go. All right. So in keeping with my um, theme from the poem earlier, I just want to remind you all that it's the decisions that you make that bother the public, not the people that you are. I'm sure you're all good people, supportive families. So when I come up here to speak, it's not on a personal level. It's on a decision basis. So uh, with that said, here we go again with another patronizing bedtime story on the values that some of you are the antithesis of. When someone shows you who they are, believe them. And there are a couple of you on here who I feel that based on your decisions, they show that all you care about is self-aggrandizement. So I bring you some recent legislation that you could be codifying into board policy, but instead we're patting ourselves on the back. SB 274 requires administrators to reply in writing to a staff member who has referred a student for willful defiance or behavioral support. And that response needs to include a description of the restorative steps taken. And if no steps were taken to address the student's behavior, the administrator needs to provide a rationale for why. I believe that the failures of certain directors and administrators in this district have created an environment where PBIS is not effective and a big reason is because there's no follow through on the restorative actions and even consequences. Yes consequences. So when we see that follow back and administrators are reaching out to their teachers and saying, hey, this is what I did. This is why I didn't do it. That's actually a requirement of SB 274 that they have five days to respond in writing with what they did. So I would hope that the board is more interested in upholding SB 274 and supporting our struggling administrators instead of these sanctimonious stories. So thank you. Um, I will bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Is there any deliberation from the board on this item? No. All right. 
Seeing none, I will move us forward. Um, but I'd like to call a point of order at the time at 1020 and ask that if a board member will please make a motion to extend our board meeting and please be in consideration that we do need to return to closed session the length of time we need. Extend this to midnight. Okay. All right. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scal. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right. That will carry uh, 7 0. The board meeting has now been extended till midnight. Now I will move us to item 13.3, the sustainable budget team, and this, present, this report will be presented by Superintendent of PVUS Schools, Dr. Heather Contreras. So good evening. As promised, we said that after every sustainable budget team meeting, we would bring that presentation back to the school board so that you're kept apprised of what's happening in the sustainable budget team meetings. We met as a sustainable budget team for our second session. We had all 24 members in attendance um, at that meeting, and we had Dr. Scott Siegel, an outside consultant who worked with the board over the summer on a special budget study session, uh, present the same presentation that was presented to the board. Uh, we went through the different um, trend data that we had seen of our budget from 2016 forward. Um, there were really great questions asked by the team and appreciation, I believe, for the materials that were presented. Uh, this it was to lay the foundation and an understanding of our current budget situation um, and kind of set a premise for what types of decisions we might want to look at um, as the team goes forward. So this presentation is included. We can click forward um, kind of quickly uh, because it is a presentation that has been before the board already. So we went through team norms, our consensus, how we'll reach consensus as a budget team, how this aligns to our district goals, as well as our alignment to our LCAP goals, uh, and what our purpose is. I do want to pause on this for a little bit because uh, the purpose, again, is to bring a recommendation forward to the board from the budget team, one or two, maybe plan A, B, C, uh, whatever the team decides is important. So that will be happening, we plan in a January meeting. We aligned this to our core values for allocating resources, which is that all of our decisions stay student-centered, that we ensure equity and access, that we prioritize our core educational goals, and that we consider long-term educational investments. These are some um, slides pictures of the work that was done by the sustainable budget team as we set to uh, make a problem statement. We're using a seven-step problem-solving um, model. And so we looked at how we would create and craft a problem statement together that would be the statement we were hoping to solve. Um, these words were part of the group work that came out of um, the creation of the problem statement, and we kind of reached consensus on words that meant the most to us and then formed some sentences. So here is the sentence of our problem statement. Uh, we crafted this initially. We're getting a little bit of feedback. It should be solidified uh, by the next sustainable budget team meeting and then come back to the board. But our problem statement is, PVUSD is facing a significant challenge due to declining enrollment and the loss of one-time pandemic funding. To address this issue, we must reprioritize and reimagine our services to scale effectively and maximize available resources. Our goal is to maintain high-quality educational offerings while ensuring equitable access for all students. And to achieve this, we must implement transparent strategies ultimately positioning our district for success in a sustainable manner. Uh, we got a little feedback that transparent strategies didn't make a lot of sense, so we're gonna bring this back for a revision based on the input that we got, and then this should be the problem statement that we'll be seeking to solve through the sustainable budget team. 
This is the seven step problem solving model. So we were in step one of defining the problem, and now we're beginning to enter into step number two, where we're gathering data and analyzing the information and data, and then pre preparing a shared context for all of um, the district's educational partners. We'll be looking at our next sustainable budget team meeting to, uh, and you can see right here on the slide deck, our, our next meeting will be 1016. We'll be looking specifically at our contracts and partnerships and what those equity impacts are with those. I'm currently in the process of meeting with every single one of our educational partners and community partnerships that we have to individually front load them that we'll be looking at this information together with the sustainable budget team so that everyone understands the context under which we're doing that. And that was all for session number two. Thank you, Dr. Contreras. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Ms. Webb. Uh, I wanted to once again um, thank you, uh, Dr. Contreras, about how you're running this. Um, I like the transparency of it. I like the representation of it. I like the collaboration of it. Um, th like a lot of the way you're, you're operating it, I see the educator in you, and it's like beautiful to see. I feel like this is like you at your best. Uh, when you're doing like some other things in, the, in that comment last week, the very the beginning, the limit one, no, but this, great. A um, couple questions. Uh, how much has been spent total? I feel like this should come out publicly at some point. Has been spent total related to um, that whole PN day issue that we had with the union versus the district last year? How much has been spent on that total? And then specifically, how much has been spent on that since you arrived? Um, you know, maybe it's like all the Dr. Rodriguez thing but I feel like we ought to know. Also, why it's already came out in this meeting that um, the, the SRO at Wattsville High is not there. Are we realizing any savings on that? Um, at Renaissance, I used to collect the recyclables of the students. It would be like, I'd take the bag home, much less for now I do the same at Wattsville High, but my goodness, do they have way more recycling? And I'm wondering, like, are we realizing any of the, like, I feel like that's a small funding piece that I could get for, if I could just get that to, to buy a subscription to The Economist or some minor thing, like, I would like that. Um, so, and I'm also wondering, is there a plan for utilizing our capital resources? I've brought this up before. I mean, like, renting fields, renting our facilities. Is there a plan to do that? Um, I want to see that we are at least considering that before we make some crazy changes. Um, oh, thank you, Trustee Soto, for getting the pronunciation of Mr. Denise's last name correct on the last item. Thank you. I'll bring this back to the board for questions, comments, and deliberation. Is there any deliberation from the board? All right. Seeing none, I will now adjourn the board to reconvene to closed session. This meeting is adjourned.